Johnson. Get that recount done so we can we can move on with our life. It's going to be a lot of recounts. Um, I'd like to see it have ended today so we'd know, but we don't. Let me be clear. In Pennsylvania, every vote is going to count. The, the, the issue is, is there a road to victory without Pennsylvania being called for a while? Uh, and, and for Biden, the answer is yes. Hey, everyone. Me again, Allison Morris. You are watching special election coverage on NBC News Now. The first polls in the country closed 24 hours ago, but millions of ballots are still being counted. This race not over quite yet. Here's where things stand right now. Joe Biden has 253 electoral votes to President Trump's 214. The road to 270 in the White House in the hands of voters in a shrinking number of key battleground states. You can see them right there. Uh, right now, the race in Pennsylvania still to early to call with 86 percent of the vote in. President Trump is ahead, but Governor Tom Wolf is stressing that votes are still being counted and we might not have the final results for a matter of days. NBC News correspondent Rahema Ellis is in Philadelphia. MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jansing is in Harrisburg. Uh, Rahema, Governor Wolf spoke last hour. What is he saying? What is happening right now there in Philadelphia? Well, one of the things that the governor is doing is making his voice heard regarding the questions that are being raised about this counting of the ballots. You, as you point out, uh, the president's campaign has come here today in Philadelphia to say it's filed a lawsuit. They want to stop the counting of those ballots, those mail-in ballots, because they say they're being done illegally, not allowing Republican poll watchers to see what's going on. They think that the counting is being done in secret. Just take a listen to what the governor had to say about all of that. This afternoon, the Trump campaign filed a lawsuit to stop the counting of ballots in Pennsylvania. That is simply wrong. It goes against the most basic principles of our democracy. It takes away the right of every American citizen to cast their vote and to choose our leaders. Our election officials at the state and local level should be free to do their jobs without fear, without intimidation, without attacks. These attempts to subvert, subvert the democratic process are simply disgraceful. We're going to fight every single attempt to disenfranchise voters. We will continue to administer free and fair elections in Pennsylvania. And they say that the process here is transparent. Behind me, Allison, right now at this Pennsylvania Convention Center, uh, counting of these mail-in ballots is going on. And they say it's going on around the clock. They've got a 24-hour schedule of counting this. This afternoon, they came out and said that the ballots here in Philadelphia had, they have processed about 66% of those mail-in ballots. And they're going to keep going, as the governor said, until every single one of them is counted. And that includes going up until 5 o'clock on Friday when they got a court ruling that gave them a three-day extension to count any ballots that had been legitimately postmarked by the end of the balloting or, or voting yesterday at 8 p.m., those legitimate ones would be allowed to come in. And the governor says they're going to be counted. Allison? Thanks, Rahema. Uh, Chris, over to you. Governor Wolf, obviously today urging Pennsylvanians to be patient. It's going to be a little while as the votes are yeah. still being tallied. What is the latest on the vote count? What are you hearing from election officials there? Yeah, continuing to manage expectations, although actually I think a lot of the elections, the commissioners feel like things are going very well. They haven't had any of the problems that have been alleged, for example, by the Trump campaign. No proof of any of that. So let me give you some of the latest numbers. First of all, the big picture, this race is definitely narrowing. It's definitely too close to call. But this morning, Donald Trump was up between 10 and 11 percentage points over Joe Biden. That has narrowed to about 4 percent. And the Biden campaign likes the votes that are left, where Rahema is in Allegheny County. These are the latest numbers that they have put out. Allegheny still has 110,000 votes that they need to count in Pittsburgh, but they think they're actually going to get that done sometime tonight or into the early morning hours. In fact, the Pittsburgh Steelers have offered to send dinner to the workers there who have said they're going to continue to work through. So we could have some big numbers coming out of Pittsburgh and that entire county tomorrow. As far as uh, the Philadelphia area, they have about 120,000 that they have yet to count. They don't want to give any kind of projections. 
Overall, what the governor said today was there are about a million ballots still to be counted. Now, some of them have been counted throughout the course of the day. We don't have a later number on that. But when you talk to the commissioners out in some of the smaller counties, they're saying maybe Friday. It's been interesting watching some of the little things that happen. Remember, they've never had anything like this. They've never had a number of mail-in ballots like this between COVID and allowing no excuse mail-in balloting. Uh, for example, in uh, one county, they were getting uh, FedExes. Well, the law says you have to have a postmark from the U.S. Postal Service. So they've set those handful of FedExes aside. They're going to have to figure out whether those votes get counted. Is it a technicality or do they have to go uh, to the letter of the law? But the most important thing is they do feel like they have followed the procedure. They feel like the lawsuits that have been tossed out, every, every uh, accusation by the Trump campaign that has been filed in both state, federal and local courts has been tossed. And they feel like that when they do come to this final number, mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, something that they can stand behind. It's going to be legitimate and they can feel good about. One more thing. It's a beautiful backdrop I have here. I'm sure you're noticing, uh, Allison. There are about 300, maybe even more people on the steps of the uh, Capitol here in Harrisburg a little earlier showing their support for Joe Biden and for the governor and the secretary of state who have been under fire from Republicans. Uh, and they're just sending a simple message. Count every vote. Count my vote. They were here for about an hour. There were some speeches, again, showing their support for the idea that everybody just needs to be patient, mm -hmm. take a breath. The results will come in. Allison, voters showing fuel dogs over there. I was going to say it's, it so sounded a little bit not like human beings behind you, <laughs> uh, Chris. The voters <laughs> showing their support. The dogs showing their support. The Pittsburgh Steelers showing their support. And I, I, that is a classy move uh, for a gal from Ohio to mention that. So thank you so much, uh, Chris Rahema. You know, thank you both. Me. Thank you for I, noticing. I, I, I do. As a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I understand. I don't know if I could do that for the Browns, uh, Chris. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, let's dive into the numbers at this hour. NBC News political editor Carrie Dan joining us now. Carrie uh, has been running us through the numbers all evening long. Uh, Carrie, we have let you kind of run the show here. So you tell us what are the states that you're watching at this hour? Well, let's take a quick look at the Pennsylvania map just so you can kind of picture where these votes are coming from. Um, on in the Pittsburgh area, which will be on sort of the left side of your screen in the West, that's Allegheny County. That's what Chris was just talking about. That's a really important um, source of votes for um, for Democrats. That's where Joe Biden thinks they could get even uh, even as 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 early as tonight, probably pretty soon. They're hoping for an update on some votes there. And on the of course the the southeastern side, that's Philadelphia and the surrounding co counties, places like. Delaware County, Montgomery, that's another place that Democrats have historically, this is not new, they've historically tried to kind of run up the score in these urban areas in Pennsylvania. This is no exception. And Joe Biden thinks, as Chris and Rahima were saying, they think that they are getting the numbers that they need. Uh, and the Trump campaign is just trying to hope that they have enough to offset that. Now let's go to Arizona. This is a really important state to watch. It is also really looking like a real must win for Donald Trump, and it's not really going in his direction right now. And sort of the, um, the it looks like sort of an upside down L, that's Maricopa County. Um, we estimate that there's going to be about 2 million votes there total. We've got about 1.6, about 80% of them. So we're waiting on that other 20% of votes in Maricopa County. The reason Maricopa is so important, it makes up almost two thirds of the vote in this state. It contains um, Phoenix. If you have heard um, my big boss, Chuck Todd, talk about this county, he kind of calls it like America's suburb. It is just a quintessential suburban county. And it is such a swing, swing area of this state. Um, Democrats who win here tend to win statewide. Republicans who win here tend to win statewide. And another reason to really keep an eye on this, this is a state that has not gone for a Democrat since 1996. And Democrats are very excited about the prospect, if they can pull this flip off, of, of keeping this state as a permanent part of their road to 270. There's uh, young Latinos in the state. There is, as I mentioned, that suburban um, population in Maricopa. So this is definitely worth ke keeping an eye on. And really what we're waiting for is to see if the remaining vote in Maricopa looks like 
the vote that, that Biden has gotten out of there to date, uh, which looks like about a 6% advantage. We need to see the remaining vote to see if it looks like what he's already gotten or if it looks like it's more Republican leaning. Um, I will note that uh, NBC News has not called the race in Arizona. We, it's too early to call, but Joe Biden is leading in our assessment. Other networks have called that race, and the, our White House team reports that the Trump campaign was very upset with those calls. And a key reason for that was how much Trump would need to win this state to get to 270. If he can't, it really closes off his likely paths. Um, one more state that we're keeping an eye on tonight is Georgia. Um, Priscilla Thompson, my colleague, reports that it's probably going to be until tomorrow morning until we get a full assessment. But there is one key county, uh, Fulton, which is uh, one of those Atlanta suburban counties, uh, that is uh, probably going to give us some kind of assessment of what vote is remaining tonight. So we may get a better sense of the data there. Again, this is a place that Joe Biden is hoping that he can really capitalize on those suburban voters around a diverse and affluent Atlanta to try to make up that difference that you see um, between him and the president. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about the paths that Joe Biden has and Donald Trump has. For Joe Biden, he does not need the state of Pennsylvania to win this thing. He could win both the state of Nevada and Arizona. That gets him to exactly 270. So that gets him there without needing the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and that's and that's one reason that you see, I think, in Pennsylvania, Republicans focusing some of those legal efforts because it's so important for them. Or Joe Biden can just win Pennsylvania. That gets him over 270. That means that, uh, you know, barring anything that we're not expecting, that would mean that he would be heading to the White House. But for Donald Trump at this point, unless one of these races changes, he must win Georgia. He must win North Carolina. He must win Pennsylvania. And that only gets him to 268 electoral votes. So he would have to win one of those outstanding, Nevada or Arizona. That's why you're seeing so much focus, I think, from Republicans on Arizona, because they think that might be their last best chance. Right now, you know, it's, there, there's, there are some legal challenges. We've got to keep our eye on those. We've got to keep an eye on the outstanding vote in some of those other states, like North Carolina and Georgia. But right now, the path to 270 for Biden is looking like he's got a couple different ways to do it. And for Donald Trump, he's really got to pull an inside straight. Carrie, thank you so much. We have checked in with you, I think, three times, but it feels like uh, we, we keep bugging you all evening long. So thank you so much for kind of showing us the paths uh, and where we are about 24 hours after the polls, the first polls closed last night. Appreciate um, it. Of course, when you, when you said that at the beginning, that po first polls closed 24 hours ago, I was like, is that 20? Have I been awake? <sighs> yes, I have. Yeah, yes, I just I think <laughs> the days are melding together. I mean, this whole year has been like this, but this week just fits right into 2020, right? It's the, the time space continuum is just totally out of whack. Yeah, it's like March 675th or something by <laughs> this point, right? <laughs> Feels about right. <laughs> Gary, thank you. Right, thank you so much. Have a great night. You too. Joe Biden, the projected winner in Michigan, picking up 16 electoral votes. NBC News correspondent Heidi Prisbilla joins me now from Detroit. Heidi, we understand protesters were outside a vote counting facility there. I know you've been tracking that throughout the day. Police were called in. What's happening there? Yeah, Allison, I'm outside the TCF Center here in downtown Detroit, where those final absentee ballots are being tallied in the building behind me. And earlier today, this was the scene of some consternation as we saw a, really a number of self-proclaimed poll watchers descend on this building. They kind of stormed into the room where the ballots were being counted and said that they were designated poll watchers uh, when in fact that they were not designated by either state party and they actually prevented even some of the poll watchers that were designated by the state parties on each side from getting into that room, Allison. So we talked to individuals who were in the room and they said it really didn't in the end prevent them from doing their jobs, but it did create a bit of a scene here, even though we knew in advance that this more protracted process of counting the ballots was not, it was just entirely predictable because of the fact that the GOP legislature refused to acquiesce to the request by the Secretary of State and other state officials to give them more time to count these ballots. So now the numbers are in and the question really is not so much about what's going on behind me, but about a lawsuit now that President Trump is trying to file here in Michigan, as well as in some other of these uh, close battleground states, Allison. 
Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, it's just unbelievable what we have been watching over the last 24 hours, as you said, whether it's the close races, the, the folks outside, the legal battles. Uh, this is a, an election year like no other. Appreciate you, you being with us. Thanks so much. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. <laughs> Every morning on today. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail at the center of this campaign. Coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. <laughs> Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. The Trump campaign mounting a swing state legal blitz announcing today it will sue to stop ballot counting in Pennsylvania. The team also requesting a recount in Wisconsin. NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce breaks down what recount rules look like in the battleground states. As the nation anxiously waits to find out who the next president will be, all eyes are on several key states that could ultimately decide the race. Now, ballots are still being counted in these battlegrounds, but results so far suggest tight margins between President Trump and Joe Biden. And if the final vote total is super close, candidates can request recounts in most of these states. So let's run through the recount rules in these battlegrounds, starting with that coveted blue wall that President Trump turned red in 2016. Wisconsin doesn't have automatic recounts, but candidates can petition one if the margin of votes is 1% or less. That's why the Trump campaign is planning to ask for a recount, even though Joe Biden is the apparent winner there. And by that, we mean Biden has won the race, but the final results could depend on confirming vote totals or a potential recount. Now, if that happens, Wisconsin has 13 days to retally the votes. Now, Michigan does have automatic recounts if the margin is 2,000 votes or less. That's a very slim margin. NBC has called Biden the apparent winner in the state, and he leads by at least 60,000 votes. But a candidate can also request one within two days of canvassing if there is evidence of fraud or errors. In either case, the process would need to be completed 39 days after the initial votes were certified. And in Pennsylvania, where we're still waiting on more than a million votes as of Wednesday, an automatic recount goes into effect when there's a difference of half a percentage point or less. That process would need to be finished by November 29th. As for the candidates, three electors can petition a recount in a contested district if they claim mistakes were made. Now let's zoom out of the Rust Belt and zoom in on Georgia. No automatic recounts here, but candidates can ask for one if the margin is within half a percent. They have two business days after county certification to submit their request. 
and in North Carolina, no automatic recounts here either. Candidates can make a request if the margin is within 10,000 votes, based on how many people voted in the state. And if an initial machine recount doesn't change the results, a hand-to-eye recount can be requested as well. And like North Carolina, Nevada also doesn't have automatic recounts. But the state does allow losing candidates to petition one regardless of margin. Requested recounts need to take place within 10 days. Now, Arizona is the outlier here. It's the only state we're watching that doesn't allow candidates to request a recount. That means automatic recounts are the thing to watch here if the margin is within 0.1%. It is 2020, so anything is possible, but based on the latest tally, that does seem unlikely. Look, we're still waiting on all the votes to be counted, but at least we know what we can expect if these battlegrounds enter recount territory. The fight continues in Nevada. It is a state that President Trump narrowly lost in 2016, but tonight it is still too early to call. Joe Biden is currently leading by more than 8,000 votes. Nevada election officials say they will release more results tomorrow morning. NBC News' Jolene Kent has more from North Las Vegas. Hey, Allison, we are here in Las Vegas at Clark County Elections Headquarters. And right behind me, you can see these black boxes. Those are the voting machines that have all been returned to Elections Headquarters now that the voting is over. But we are far from getting all of the votes counted here. In fact, we were just talking to the elections official. They say they still don't know how many votes are left to count. But we do know that six electoral votes are up for grabs. It's a really important path for Joe Biden to, for his path to 270 if he is to capture the White House. So taking a look at what's going on here in Nevada, that we are being told that overall they're counting, at least here in Clark County, mail-in votes, votes from overseas, votes from disabled people, and taking all of those totals. We'll have an update on that tomorrow. We're also waiting on an update from Reno as well to hear how those votes have been counted in this very tight race. You may remember back in 2016, Hillary here won just just barely edging out President Trump. So President Trump has been campaigning here and certainly a big priority for the Trump campaign. But looking ahead, we're looking at the economic issues here on the ground in Las Vegas. The unemployment here is higher than the national average. And it actually, in our NBC News exit polls, shows the economy is more important here than the handling of the coronavirus. And the reason that matters is that Republicans have been relatively successful in some ways in uh, uh, pinning some of the challenges that the coronavirus economy, this recession we've been facing, on the Democratic governor. And that may affect Biden. But what we do know is mail-in ballots, which are still being counted here in Clark County, historically have favored the Democrats. But again, we just don't know how they're going to fall this time. And you'll also want to remember two things. First, the Trump campaign has brought several lawsuits to Clark County and to the state of Nevada about the way that things are being handled. Actually, I believe it's only to the state of Nevada. So there's that one side of it. And the other side is that anyone here can file and ask for a recount. There's no minimum threshold. Anyone can do it. So a campaign can do it. A candidate can do it. The citizen, once that is requested, they have to do it in 10 days. So we'll see as Clark County, as the state of Nevada counts all these ballots, What's going to come down the pike? But I guess all I have to say on that front is stay tuned, Allison. Over to Arizona, which is also still too early to call. Joe Biden currently leading President Trump 51 to 47.6. 11 electoral votes are at stake here. NBC News political reporter Vaughn Hilliard has more from Phoenix. Allison, there are still anywhere from 500,000 to 600,000 outstanding ballots here in the state of Arizona. That margin, uh, that lead for Joe Biden right now is just 3.4 percent. And when you look at those several hundred thousand ballots that are out, there's a lot of question marks about which way they're going to trend. You know, that Joe Biden lead is that just 93,000. And if you do some quick uh, homework, uh, Donald Trump is going to have to take about 58 percent of that share in order to overcome Joe Biden. And when you look at uh, the late voting, you know, folks that were turning in their mail-in ballots late and folks that were voting in person just yesterday, they were going overwhelmingly, not only in Maricopa County, but across the state to Donald Trump. 
Now the question is, does this batch of several hundred thousand, which about two thirds of them are from Maricopa County, the other third are from around the rest of the state, do those reflect that? Or as Democrats suggest, uh, uh, several Democrats suggest to me, that those are folks that Democrats that would typically come out to vote in person on election day, or uh, because Democrats were urging folks not to mail their ballot in in the last days that they came in hand dropped it off at polling locations. And so tonight we should get a much better idea at 9 p.m. Uh, when Maricopa County says that they're going to drop uh, a, a, another batch of these results. The path to 270 is starting to narrow, but it could still take a few more days to determine a clear winner in the presidential race. Joe Biden and President Trump taking very different strategies as the votes trickle in. NBC News correspondent Mike Memelis in Wilmington, Delaware, covering the Biden campaign, of course. NBC News political reporter Monica Alba has the latest from the Trump campaign. Monica, the president's path to an electoral college win starting to narrow. Does the campaign still see a way to win? And I imagine it might involve three things we have been been talking about throughout this campaign, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania. That's exactly right, Allison. Yes, the Trump reelect effort still seeing a much more narrow path than they have over the last 24 and 48 hours with some of those major states in the Midwest now going to former Vice President Joe Biden's column. Of course, Michigan and Wisconsin campaign aides had been less optimistic about them, but they were still hoping it was possible to maybe get one of them. Without either of them, it comes down exactly, as you say, to Pennsylvania and that critical Rust Belt question. Even though the president did quite well in the Sun Belt with Florida. They do believe also he will eke it out in North Carolina. But there are questions now about Georgia and then, of course, Arizona, two states that the president thought he would be able to defend based on how he did in 2016 that now we're seeing very tight races in NBC News. It's too early to call either of those. But everything essentially has to break in the president's way in order for him to think about a second term here. And that's why you see the campaign now resorting to these legal options. They are now now talking about lawsuits in the state of Michigan. They've demanded a recount in the state of Wisconsin, and they're unveiling new legal action in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which also, yes, NBC News has not been able to project on yet because of just how much of the vote is still outstanding and still being counted, Allison. But tonight, the president is complaining about his campaign's legal strategy on Twitter, and he's making other false claims, trying to declare himself the victor in some of these states that, again, NBC News is not able to call and we're waiting and could go late into the night tonight and tomorrow before we have a clearer picture of where they are. Certainly a bit defensive tonight and quite defiant still as we wait to see what happens here, Allison. Mm. Mike, let's set up my first question for you with a clip of Joe Biden. This is from earlier today. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Just a little bit different from President Trump, who falsely declared victory uh, <laughs> late last night into this morning. Uh, he's claiming states on Twitter today, falsely claiming states on Twitter. How is the Biden campaign responding uh, to these campaign, uh, these claims from President Trump? Well, of course, what they're pointing out is that the president really doesn't have a path in their view. What was so significant about uh, the calls today of Wisconsin and Michigan is for the first time in the last 24 hours, somebody was winning road games, to use a sports analogy, a Biden winning states that President Trump had won four years ago. That's the name of the game. And so if you look at the states that are outstanding that haven't been called, Nevada is the only one that, that uh, Hillary Clinton won four years ago that is still uh, on the table. Otherwise, it's all Trump states that Joe Biden's team still thinks he can flip. And so they're already starting to really slowly but surely look forward. And we saw the Biden team, the transition team, uh, unveil their website today. Now, by law, the Biden team has had to have a transition team uh, underway for months. But an interesting signal of what the strategy might continue to be over the days ahead as the votes continue to come in in Pennsylvania and the Biden team's view, putting them closer and closer to 270 votes as we may get calls soon in Arizona and Nevada, which on their own would put them at 200. 170 exactly, uh, but the Biden team projecting that he is ready to start having a conversation to the country as president-elect and not the former vice president, which I've been calling him forever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, Monica and Mike, thank you both so much.
morning from NBC News election headquarters in New York as we bring you continuing coverage of this presidential election like no other. Decision 2020, so far without a decision, as votes are still being counted in a handful of key states that remain too close to call. We meet again, and that news uh, that means that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden are still short of the all-important number 270. That's the number of electoral votes needed to win. So here's where the map stands at this hour. Joe Biden has 253 electoral votes, including 10 from Wisconsin, where NBC called Biden the apparent winner today, just this afternoon, in a close race that likely will end up in a recount. And 16 electoral votes from Michigan called for Biden just a short time ago by NBC News. And Donald Trump has 214 electoral votes. That leaves six states now, and they're biggies. Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, North Carolina, and Alaska yet to be called. You don't want to hear this, but it's good. It could be days or longer before all this is sorted out. Joe Biden says he remains optimistic that he will ultimately prevail, even as President Trump falsely claims victory and files lawsuits with some three million votes in those contested states still to be counted. All right. So that brings us to Chuck Todd, who has been living at his boards. And we did get more votes in today. Some votes still being counted. Where does it stand? Well, look, let me first just do... Uh, the, where, where we stand right now on the road to 271st. And let's make it simple. You showed where the, everything stands now. So if, ev if everything holds with the current leaders, right? So we're going to put everything. Biden currently leads in Nevada, currently leads in Arizona. Trump currently leads in Alaska. Trump currently leads in Pennsylvania. Trump currently leads in North Carolina. And Trump currently leads in Georgia. If all is that, this is what we'd be staring at which is actually even more narrow than 2,000, which was 271, 267. This would put you 270, 268. So as you can see here, it's the president that has uh, more work to do, and that's what we're going to find out tonight. Uh, because tonight, we're going to see where things we think... Excuse, oh, give me a second here. It's day two of this, right? <laughs> tonight, we expect to finally, just like we had gotten Michigan and Wisconsin earlier today, we expect in some time tonight... Uh, in Arizona that we're going to get enough of the vote of this, find out what's out there, a piece of it, and see if there is enough out there for President Trump to catch Joe Biden here. We don't think so, but we want to see a little bit of this vote, and we expect this afternoon. So then Jeff, you throw this in the nature of the vote that's outstanding in Arizona? The early vote? Well, for the, uh, most of, vote. in fairness, in Arizona, almost everybody does it by mail. Yes. Right. So it's, it's much harder to sit there and say, you know, definitively, this is Biden vote. Everybody votes by mail there. We know the Election Day only vote. Yes, certainly leans the president. That's all done. But we can't sit here and make the same. We're pretty confident Nevada is mail in votes. They lean Biden. Ditto in Pennsylvania. What I about can, regions? I cannot sit here and say that with that same confidence here. I do want to check in with Maricopa because... As you, you know, uh, as Maricopa goes, so goes the state. And this is, a, this is another problem. I don't, you know, usually you can't really carry the state unless you win Maricopa. And I don't know how the president makes up 100,000 votes in, in Maricopa here. But do here. you know where these outstanding Arizona That's votes are That's the problem. We from. don't know where okay. they all are. And okay. See, you're, you're, you're hitting me with all your Arizona stuff, and I, and I know No, I just... No, and that's the point. <laughs> no, we don't... Uh, in Pennsylvania, for instance, we know there's a big chunk just sitting in here in Philadelphia County. Right. We know more than a quarter of the vote. And you do the math here. Let me just show you just uh, over the last two times in Philadelphia, what kind of gaps. This is a four hundred and eighty thousand vote gap out of here right now. Joe Biden leads here by three hundred and forty. So he's likely at a minimum to get to net another hundred thousand votes just out of Philadelphia. And it could be more than that. Look, Barack Obama won it by nearly half a million. Uh, in 2012. So this is a case, Philadelphia, we have that kind of, and because of where we know the vote, and that's where I go back with Arizona, it's more, it's more dispersed. It's more all over the place. But that answer may be coming quicker. The Arizona answer, we think that's something we're going to have tonight. All right. All right. Speaking of Pennsylvania, it's important. That's why Andrea Mitchell is there. She's made her way to Philadelphia. I would also say hometown girl. She knows this uh, area very well. Andrea, what are you hearing from your sources tonight? Well, it is completely different from last night. The mail-in balloting was going so slowly last night. They've never done it before. They couldn't start doing it until, you know, Election Day. And it was going slowly, and it was frustrating a lot of people here in Philadelphia. Now they're finally getting used to it. 
and they're picking up, it was about 20% of the mail-in in Philadelphia uh, this morning. Now it's up to about 66%. Uh, you can hear that this is a very noisy city. There's a lot going on. There are a bunch of uh, count all your vote protests as well as some Black Lives Matter protests, uh, very peaceful protests, because the body cam uh, was uh, released today on that uh, terrible shooting in West Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago. So there's a lot of action around me. In any case, uh, what Chuck was just referring to is Barack Obama got a margin of 465,000 out of Philadelphia. They're telling me here that they expect that Joe Biden will get 470,000, do better than Obama and certainly better than Clinton. So that's what they're that's what they're looking at. And I talked to a very prominent elected official, a top Democrat in the uh, current elected official in the state, uh, in the western part of the state, and he said tonight to me that they're going to win by 100,000 votes here. And that's what they're predicting. They say in Montgomery County, you know, Casey Hunt knows that area well. Bucks County, that they're just the Biden is just crushing them, and they're beginning to get that in. Allegheny County is still working; they're working round the clock out in Pittsburgh to try to get that vote in. Hey, Andrea, what's the, what's the read on on it's lawsuits in, in Pennsylvania and how prepared the Democrats are, and if there are any potential showstopper suits? They don't think so. And, you know, there's a lot of lawyering going on here. Josh Shapiro, the attorney general, I interviewed him today, and the uh, governor had a news conference to reassure everyone that every vote is going to be counted and that it's going to be do it, done, ac you know, accurately. There was an appeal. Eric Trump was here and Rudy Giuliani uh, while I was traveling down, so I wasn't at that news conference. They were out at the airport. But they were appealing that they wanted to have monitors, poll watchers, observe the count. And a judge ruled that they didn't have the right to do that, but that if they could make it COVID safe, they could have some observers if they wanted to. Um, I, you know, there's no evidence here from all my reporting, uh, the calls last night, we've all been making calls, from everything that people have said, that anything shady is going on. But the president has this thing about Philadelphia, and, you know, it seems to be for days and days and weeks trying to you know, undermine the credibility of this vote here. But they say they're going to get it done. It's just going to be slow. And they don't think it may get done by tomorrow night, but it could be Friday. Andrea, is there any uh, outstanding vote that's being counted? I think you mentioned Allegheny County, but more in Trump country, where uh, any of that deficit that might be created because of this, the surge of Democratic votes in Philadelphia <coughs> County, where it might be mitigated? Right. Well, the president absolutely overperformed you know, he does very well out there. He's got a strong union base and his regular base. Uh, one elected official said to me tonight, uh, you know, he said, the president is unique in current politics. He is the strongest Republican to run in Pennsylvania, a, a union state, heavily union state, the strongest Republican since Ronald Reagan. And he said, it's not even close. No other Republican can do what Donald Trump does in Pennsylvania. So they have to deliver out of Philadelphia and the suburbs and Allegheny County and some Lackawanna County because of the Scranton roots of Joe Biden. And they believe they're doing it. Let's bring uh, Casey, Hunt, Casey Hunt into this conversation. Yeah, no, and I, I grew up, as Andrea mentioned, uh, in, the, in the Philadelphia suburbs. And, and the state really is a perfect example of the cultural really tribal divides that are defining this election. You've got the two cities uh, and, the, and the suburbs on either side of the state, and then you've got this wide swath uh, of rural areas uh, in the middle. And, you know, the reality is people in the cities sometimes use derogatory names for that part of the state. Uh, and the divide in Pennsylvania is going to just be so close. I've got a couple of sources that I'm talking to who are looking at the numbers there. Uh, Democrats seem to be expecting still a narrow uh, Biden win, although obviously we're, uh, we're not projecting that at this point. But if he does win there, it's going to be by like half a percentage point. It's, it's going to be essentially tied, which I think is representative of, of the country as a whole. And that's a big part of the reason. Well, that's focused. one of the big stories. You know, we, we would hear over the last four years, Democrats saying lightning's not going to strike twice. OK, Donald Trump made magic happen in these upper Midwest blue wall states once, but it can't happen again. Well, it near did and may still yet in Pennsylvania. The votes aren't done being counted there. Well, you could look at it from the other way. There is some there is. Basically, Donald Trump is now going to lose the same way he won, right? He's going to lose very narrowly in a small band of states because Joe Biden overperformed with suburban voters. You know, so it is it is interesting there. But this what you point out with Pennsylvania and you kept saying this every single state is essentially there's 
it has divided itself in some form of this where you have the one or two major metropolitan areas uh, are one set of politics, one set of culture, and there is almost this revolt against that culture, whatever yeah. you will, almost an automatic vote against it from, from, from either side of this cultural Divide. And I was talking to one uh, Republican, uh, a moderate Republican uh, in the in the Philadelphia area, who uh, had been one of the first people to warn me about President Trump and about how bad losses were going to be for Republicans in 2018 when they lost all those seats in the House. Uh, and and this person was telling me, well, you know, I was a little worried about it because I started to hear uh, from uh, some uh, people I was talking to, from my friends, from people who had complained about President Trump, that they didn't really like the feeling they were getting from a culture perspective of how they were being treated by liberals, by the other side. And he's, uh, this, this source of mine told me that, that he knows a woman who decided to vote for President Trump again, even though she said uh, to, to uh, my source that she had a really hard time with this decision, but that that divide at the end of the day, she just couldn't get past that. And I think that defined a lot of voters this time. I think we're going to find out that this has a, as much to do with culture and that feeling of uh, a dominant kind of media elite culture and the way it makes the other side feel has as much to do with elections as does the economy or COVID or uh, any policy issue. I, I, I Savannah, I might argue more so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think it is the economy. Well, there'll be time to digest that, but we still got numbers tonight. Yeah, and we're watching uh, certainly that situation in Georgia where the vote's been coming in very slowly and it appears a lot of it is in, in Democratic-friendly uh, Atlanta and the suburbs around there. Let's go to Blaine Alexander, who is on the ground there and has some read, and, and especially on what we may see in the numbers. Absolutely, Lester. So first I'll start with those numbers and then I'll give you another development that we've learned when it comes to absentee ballots. Right now we are in State Farm Arena. We've been talking a great deal about the absentee ballots here in Fulton County. Well, for the first time we're actually going to show you those ballots. You can see right here behind me there are about three dozen or so people who are in this room who are working very diligently to open the ballots, scan the ballots, then make sure that those numbers are tabulated. We just got a briefing not too long ago from the person who runs elections here in Fulton County. They've got about 28,000 or so ballots left to process still. And he says they are going to stay here through the night until they get them done. He says they're going to bring in a fresh crew of people, a fresh line of folks to come in, stay till midnight or later if necessary, but that they're not leaving until these are done. Now, that's just the picture here in Fulton County, guys. We'll talk about statewide. Across the state of Georgia, the Secretary of State says they still have about 185,000 ballots still left to process. So he is predicting that it could go later tonight or possibly into tomorrow before we get some sort of a final count. Now, the other thing that we're just getting our eyes on is a lawsuit that was filed from the Georgia GOP, the Georgia Republican Party, on behalf of the Trump campaign. And it was filed against election board officials down in Chatham County. That's a county about three hours to the southeast of Atlanta. And it has to do with absentee ballots. This, um, according to the lawsuit, is being filed to enforce election law. Now, we just got a statement from the Trump campaign as to why they're filing this, it kind of comes down to when ballots are turned in and when they can be counted. Here in the state of Georgia, an absentee ballot has to be either delivered or dropped in a drop-off mail location or drop-off location by the time polls close on Election Day. So that's 7 p.m. yesterday. Well, according to this statement, it says President Trump and his team, there was somebody who, a Republican poll observer in Georgia, witnessed 53 late absentee ballots illegally added to a stack of on-time ballots. So they're suing over that issue. Guys, we should say that we've reached out to Chatham County. We've reached out to the Georgia Republican Party to get any information about this lawsuit and these allegations and have not heard back. Guys. All right, Blaine, thank you. Let's go to Holly Jackson. She's at the White House. She's been talking to her sources deep inside the Trump campaign. Holly, what do you know? So a couple of things here, and let's pick up where Blaine left off on these legal challenges now that the president and his campaign are pushing. They see that as now one of the big battlegrounds, in addition to the states that we're talking about, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. The, the issue with the legal challenges, you've had now the president, who, by the way, we have not seen on camera today, sending out his son, one of his top surrogates, Eric Trump, Laura Trump, who works for the Trump campaign as well, to Philadelphia to talk about what they describe as the potential of fraud or cheating in the election there. Let us be very, very clear about the facts on the ground. There is no evidence 
of fraud. There have been no reports of it in any of the states where the ballots have not been counted yet. But the president is continuing, as we saw in the wee hours of the morning early this morning, to try to preemptively, prematurely claim victory in these states where we just don't have the vote. The president today saying that he hereby claims that he wins states like Pennsylvania, states like North Carolina. Those races have not been called. We have not called the races. And more specifically, a lot of ballots are still out there. This is part of what has emerged as the president's strategy now over the last, what, 12 to 18 hours to basically introduce or try to introduce some uncertainty into the election uh, in order to create some confusion about the results, despite the fact that there is no confusion. Things are proceeding exactly as we thought they would proceed so far with things in order and the ballots being counted. Yes, it's taking a while. That is to be expected. Here's one thing that I'm watching tonight that a lot of sources uh, that I've talked to just in the last couple of hours have pointed to, and that is the numbers coming in in Arizona. The Trump campaign is feeling confident about where those numbers will go. They actually are predicting the possibility that they could be very clearly the victors in that state by Friday. That is sort of the public push. Here's the, the behind the scenes piece of it. That is not a done deal. That is certainly not locked in, as Chuck explained, based on the numbers that we're seeing in Arizona. But I am told by sources that top elected officials in Arizona are the ones trying to tell the Trump campaign they actually think they could pull it out, Lester. Uh, you mentioned we haven't seen the president today, uh, Howie, and, and I'm wondering, some of, his, some of his prominent supporters were openly saying he shouldn't have gone as far as he did in the middle right. of the night with, uh, with his claim of victory. Is there, is there any suggestion that he's being taking advice now and staying out of the camera view? I would say potentially, except for what we've seen on Twitter, Lester, and that is nearly half a dozen tweets that have been slapped with warning labels by Twitter and by Facebook for having misinformation and for prematurely trying to claim victory, even though it is just way too soon to tell and the numbers don't back it up. So the president is certainly not walking back at all the comments that he made. There had been a question this morning of, hey, maybe he would try to come out and do that. We do not expect to see him again on camera tonight, Lester, although you know his Twitter account is still active. This is true. All right, uh, Hallie, thanks. It's Bring in Kristen Welker in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, with the uh, the Biden folks. Uh, we suspect they're feeling good. Uh, what do they see in all these states and these numbers and where the votes are coming from? Well, Lester, the Biden campaign and Joe Biden feeling increasingly confident because now you have these two key states in the Midwest, Michigan and Wisconsin, that have now gone for and been called for Biden. Biden being called the apparent winner, of course, in Wisconsin. It's significant because the key to his strategy all along, according to campaign officials, has been to win back that so-called blue wall. All of those critical states in the industrial Midwest that went to Donald Trump in 2016. And here we have two states that he has been able to peel off. And so that is what is fueling this sense of feeling more bullish. And we saw that when we heard from Joe Biden earlier today, when he said he wasn't speaking to declare victory, but that he feels increasingly confident that he does have the votes ultimately to get to the 270 electoral votes needed to win the White House. So that is the tone from the vice president. But look, they're still watching and waiting to see what happens in states like Arizona and Nevada. They say they feel quite optimistic about those states. But of course, it's not a done deal until all of the votes are counted. And that is another point that Joe Biden has stressed over and over again, that ultimately all the votes have been counted. One final point, they're also quite defiant in the face of these lawsuits, saying they have a team that's ready to fight, and they're calling them charades, Lester. All right, Kristen, thanks. That, Nevada is tighter than I think the Biden campaign expected it to be. Arizona, the decision there may well come tonight. We are expecting Arizona officials to release additional vote data, so stay tuned for that. We're on the air tonight. We're going to take a break right here. Our coverage of Decision 2020 continues after a short break. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? 
Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail at the center today. of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind's standing. These flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. (laughs) Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. Welcome back, and that's Arizona, a state that it could all hinge on, where we await votes tonight. All the votes are not counted, but we have heard that more votes will be released tonight. But let's take it right to the source, shall we, Lester? Yeah, Katie Hobb is the Arizona Secretary of State. Uh, Secretary, thank you for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Can can you give us the, the latest breakdown of where the votes are, what you expect tonight? Yes, a rough estimate, there are around 600,000 votes left to count in Arizona. 420,000 of those are in Maricopa County, and Maricopa County is where we're getting the um, the upload of results this evening. So they said 7 o'clock Arizona time and then 1030 Arizona time. Uh, so that should kind of give us some indication. What we don't know about those results is how many ballots are going to be included in that. Were those, uh, how much of these were, uh, were same-day voting versus mail-in? All of the same-day voting has been uh, uh, added to the results. So what we're looking at now are mail-in ballots that have not been tabulated or have, you know, they're being tabulated now. Were they sent in by mail or were these folks who walked in with their mail-in ballot and said, you know what, I'm just going to hand it right to the poll, poll worker? Potentially both. It's it's ballots that have been received by the county Monday, Tuesday, um, and were not tabulated before the election. Secretary Hobbs, you said there were about 600,000 outstanding. I think I heard you say that Maricopa County tonight is prepared to release the results of approximately 420,000. That leaves roughly 180,000. Math wasn't a strong suit uh, left over. When do you expect to see those results and where are they from? Um, let me clarify. There are 400, approximately 400, 420,000 outstanding ballots in Maricopa County. We don't know how much of those they have tabulated today and will be releasing tonight. Okay. And then the rest of the the rest of the ballots are from the balance of the state. And so again, these will be tabulated. When you say released, they'll, they'll be released as numbers, as tabulated numbers. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Secretary, how how did your process go? Um, you know, there's been so much scrutiny on on the election this year, and scrutiny is good. You know, shine a light on it. How do you feel it went in terms of the mail-in vote, which I know in Arizona is about 85 percent of the vote, and the same-day vote, the polls? Anything, anything that causes alarm for you? No, we actually had very minimal minimal reports of any problems yesterday. They were anything that was reported was addressed right away and nothing that interfered with people's ability to vote. Um, This whole election from the time early voting started on October 7th through yesterday has gone relatively smoothly. And as you know, that's under the additional challenges of the pandemic and making sure that voters could vote safely. And I think um, across the state, our election officials were really successful in preparing 
hearing for that. All right, Secretary Katie Hobbs, long night, long day. Uh, keep us posted. We'll be looking for those numbers coming out of Maricopa County, Phoenix area in Arizona. Thank you. It's a lot Thanks of votes. So it is. It's a lot, a lot left to count. I bet I, the trucks over there doing get this calculated. No, I mean, look, the, the Maricopa number, hearing that, you would assume, look, Maricopa, a lean towards Biden. We know he's been carrying it. But it's not a slam dunk for Biden. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where in Maricopa. You know Maricopa well. Scottsdale's a very Republican area, so yeah. we don't know where the ballots are. Well, for a long time in Arizona, Maricopa County was the, the red-hot center of yeah. conservative politics right. in Arizona. It was Pima County to the south that was more uh, liberal. But we have a, a great person to ask these questions right. to. If you've been wondering who's in the boiler room at NBC News, who's been crunching the numbers day and night, there he is. His name is John Lipinski, and uh, he joins us now. Hi, John. Hi. How are you? Uh, well, you know, let's talk about that. Did you hear um, what Secretary Hobbs just said of, of Arizona? She's talking about 420,000 votes uh, out of 600,000 outstanding in Arizona. And, and so the bulk is coming from Maricopa County. Uh, not to put you on the spot, what does that suggest to you? Yeah, so, I mean, it, that's really critical. I mean, as Chuck had just said, uh, Biden's slightly winning that 5246 right now. So what it tells me, it's all going to come down to Maricopa. And Trump's going to have to overperform by quite a bit of what he's actually done. Is it possible? Yes. But, I mean, he's probably going to need to win about 60 percent of that vote in Maricopa to actually to be able to catch Biden. So it's within the realm of possibility. But I'd actually rather be Biden in that in this moment. And, and this is the, the these are the votes that you've been waiting for. And that's between standing between you and calling this race. Well, yeah, it, that, that's that's right. It really is going to depend upon how many of those votes that they actually give us. They first told us they were going to give us a dump, in, you know, one early on, but now they're going to be two. I mean, I think they're trying to see how late I can stay up because I now know that the second batch is going to come at 1230 and I can stay up very late. And you can. We, we are the Energizer Bunny. But, John, let, you know, I think this is a year where transparency is really appreciated. If you can kind of bring us into your process, because, you know, folks are watching, they might see other news organizations calling a race. Some have called Arizona for Joe Biden already. We haven't. Some called Florida very early. We didn't. We wait. What is, in, in, in plain speak, what's your metric? How, do, how certain do you have to be before you're going to say, on behalf of NBC News, we have a projected winner? Well, we have to be 99.5 percent confident at a minimum. But really, Savannah, what, we, what we're doing right now is we're going through and literally scrubbing the data county by county. So it's not good enough for us just to analyze the data. We're looking at the county in a very detailed way to make sure that we don't see anything abnormal with the results. Does everything check out? We do a lot of quality control. And so we might be 99.5 percent confident. And, you know, and so maybe others were and they called it. But we need to even go a step further. We actually need to make sure it's all there and right. And, and this, uh, I don't know if this is a question. Oh, I, we got to go break. I, I spared you from the question of when we're going to know. But <laughs> <laughs> that was the question. How does it end, John? <laughs> and when? It's been him and his priest. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take a break. Thank you, John. We'll be back. Watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail at the center of this campaign. Coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The winds standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. 
We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Wednesday night, but our special election coverage continues because the votes are still being counted. The race for president is still contested. Donald Trump and Joe Biden fighting for every last electoral vote. Last night, of course, election night, but now we're into election week. Votes, as I said, still being counted in many places, and both candidates are still short of that all important number of 270 electoral votes that it takes to win. Yeah, with NBC putting Wisconsin and Michigan in his column late today, Joe Biden now stands at 253 electoral electoral votes, Donald Trump at 214. Six states remain. They are still too close or too early to call. We're looking at Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, North Carolina, and Alaska. But we note uh, Arizona, we should be getting some numbers. Yeah, we have heard from the president. He has been casting doubt about these election results, as he has for several months, now saying that he has won the election. That is not true. Votes are still being counted. We are going to see lawsuits. We are going to see recounts. And so this is what we're going to be dealing with for the next few days, perhaps weeks. Joe Biden said again today, it's up to the voters, not either campaign, to decide the outcome. We are in uncharted territory, but we're lucky to have Chuck Todd to help guide us through it all. Chuck, what's the latest in these races uncalled? And by the way, uh, we've heard from the Secretary of State in Nevada, uh, uh, who's, I'm sorry, in Arizona, who said 7 o'clock would be... 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock local time. would be 9 o'clock Eastern. Nine and then she said a second release of, of, of numbers late, even later in the night. I had, I had to remember because Arizona doesn't go on. Arizona's real daylight, confusing. Okay. They don't observe daylight savings <laughs> okay. times. It's a lifelong struggle for me as an Arizona girl. Uh, you know, it, we got Florida men in Florida. You've got this weird time zone thing. Yeah, it's yeah, the You thing. know, it's the sun. It Usually really, I just call my bakes. mom and ask her what time it's there. Time. It yeah. bakes. All right, I wanna, I'm want i going to focus on Georgia because, look, we're about to get a Nevada update. We got John Ralston. No one knows that better. We just got a sense of what's going to happen in Arizona. Um, but let me take you to Georgia, because this is one that is just organically starting to shrink again. Look at the president's lead here. It is just 45,000. And you say, okay, 95% in. What's left? We think there's some 260,000 ballots. Okay, where are those ballots? Well, let me take you to some of the places that they are. Here's one place that they are. This is Fulton County, a county that Biden carried 7226. Look at this. We think there's 30. 8,000 remaining ballots. If it breaks the same way, you know, you look at it there, you're looking at a net of 25,000 approximately. All of a sudden, you've narrowed his lead to what? Narrow that lead down to 20,000. How about we go to DeKalb County here? 90% in. You see it's an 8315 Biden County. Well, look, we still think there's 41,000. All right. Do the math here. 80, 80, 80, um, you know, he could net maybe 20 out of there. Uh, if you could, or net, you know, 15. The point is, we are sitting here, and there's enough ballots. There's about 100,000 ballots just in and around Atlanta. It's possible that he nets everything he needs there. Now, that said, there's extraneous ballots coming in all over the state. Well, I mean, the upshot is you could be headed We're, to recount territory there, too. Okay. What we basically said, as Casey said, Pennsylvania... We think it's going to be a tie, but somebody's going to be the leading vote getter and somebody's going to get those 20 electoral votes. Yep. That's where we're headed in Georgia. Georgia's essentially going to be a tie, but somebody is going to be the leading number here. And what it really means is we could have four simultaneous recounts. And if the if the if if somehow Hallie's sources about Arizona and the Trump side are correct, throw five. I mean, we already know Wisconsin is in call for the recount. What about North Carolina? At North Carolina, we're not even going to get ballots till the 12th. You know, if it gets to a 10,000 vote spread, it also could end up in recount. Obviously, we just heard that news there, and we're going to find out from Ralston here in a minute. But let's see, you know, we're only looking at right now a 7,000 vote spread. So, you know, as it's interesting, as maybe the Trump folks think, hey, that Arizona stuff looks good. Maybe we can change that blue lean back to a red lean. The problem is what's happening in Georgia. And you know what? You trade 11 for 16, that's not a good trade, uh, if you will. 
uh, on your path to 270. It's an unsettled map is the bottom line right, right now, Casey. Yeah, no, it is It is the bottom line, although I do think we're starting to get a pretty good sense of where each camp feels particularly confident. And you mentioned uh, in Arizona, the Scottsdale area, kind of a hotbed in Maricopa County of where, you know, has been conservative. I've covered congressional races there over the years. And one of my sources who's working on the race there, I mean, they, they were surprised at how well the Democrat did in, the, in a district that has traditionally been conservative. And that's an outlier for the way Democrats have felt about House races across the rest of the map. So that's one of the data points the Biden camp's looking at as they say, OK, how well are we doing here? And Georgia, I mean, I think, Chuck, my, my sense from talking to sources is it is an absolute uh, toss up. I mean, they're going back and forth. One minute it's, oh, yes, we've got this by 3,000 votes. Oh, no, we're now down by 8,000. But maybe we'll still get a Senate runoff. It's all over this the place. Is this is it's we're in the expected vote. Remember, we told you about this expected vote. We think we if there are more ballots, that's really good news for Biden. Maybe there's fewer ballots like we learned in Wisconsin. We thought there were another hunt and it turned out, oh, no, that's all the folks that voted. OK, so, you know, that is another um, unknown in this. Yeah. And that's what we're all dealing with as we wait to see what these uh, states um, uh, deliver in their vote. And we're awaiting the final vote count from Nevada. Let's get the latest on that from Joe Ling Kent in Las Vegas. Tell us what you know. Hey, Lester, that's right. There's six electoral votes that are up for grabs here, critical for Biden for that straightforward path to T-70, also critical for Trump. I asked the registrar here in Clark County, which is, of course, home to Las Vegas, if they've had any issues, have they had to stop or halt or pause the count at all? He said no. I asked him, have you heard from the Trump or Biden campaigns? Also saying no, he has not. So what they're doing right now is they're continuing to count. They can process up to about 70,000 votes a day with about their 300 uh, staff. So what's interesting here, too, in the state of Nevada, y'all were talking about recounts. Anyone can ask for a recount here in Nevada, whether you're a citizen or a candidate. And there doesn't have to be any minimum margin, so to speak. So you can ask for that recount. And remember back in 2016, when Nevada barely went for Hillary Clinton, it was a very, very narrow margin there uh, on that front. So we're waiting to hear more from Clark County tomorrow as to how many ballots are left to count, how many have already been in fully counted. Right now, they're really focused, as you mentioned, in so many other states, for the mail-in vote, right? They're talking about the mail-in vote, the provisional ballots, the ballots for new residents who have a special situation where they can cast that ballot. Also, people who are voting from overseas, disabled voters, folks like that. So they're really going through those now, but they won't disclose to us how many votes they're still counting here in Clark County. So we're expecting to get an update tomorrow morning around 10 a.m. on that front. So that could be really helpful to giving us a better picture as to how they move forward. But I also want to point out there have also been some legal challenges from the Trump campaign on that front. Uh, but so far, moving full steam ahead here, they say no issues. They're just trying to get it done. Yeah, and, and we're seeing a, a note in exchange here that uh, they may wait until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. They're going to stop, which is Secretary of State's yeah. uh, public relations officer said they're going to stop counting tonight and then in Nevada yeah. and then hopefully release some information about that. We can Tomorrow ask uh, Nevada Attorney General Aaron Ford, who joins us now. Uh, what do you know about uh, the votes not being counted until tomorrow? Well, uh, hello, Lester. Great to see you. But listen, I, I can say this. I know that our elections officials are working as hard as they can to get a accurate count as quickly as possible, because we all know that the word result means that it's the finality. And there's only one result, and that comes after every vote is being counted. Uh, and so, you know, kudos to our elected, to our uh, registrars out there for putting in the yeoman's work on this. They deserve our commendations, not our condemnation. What is going on uh, from your standpoint? You're the attorney general, not the secretary of state. So let's talk uh, so the, the legal matters. Nevada has been a place where there have been lawsuits. There have been challenges uh, to various procedures. Are you seeing any lawsuits uh, stemming from the election? What are you anticipating? Well, we, as I've said recently, stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Uh, in the event Mr. Trump uh, uh, decides to sue us again, he sued us three times already, and we've defeated him three times, uh, and in including um, one that's on appeal in the Nevada Supreme Court right now. Uh, you know, related to either um, observ observations or, or whatnot. Uh, we don't know what he intends to do next, but we are ready. We have a team. My entire office is ready to do what it needs to do in order to defend the right to vote and to ensure every vote is counted. Have there been any reports of irregularities at the polls, any irregularities with mail-in voting? Are you aware of anything along those lines? 
No, I have not. And in fact, uh, the lawsuit that, arranged, that uh, was alleged, um, that alleged that there were observation issues related to uh, poll observers uh, found that there was no evidence of what was being stated relative to uh, an improper um, um, approach that being taken there. And so, uh, you know, whether it's in court or whether it's uh, generally speaking, there have been no irregularities that uh, amount to a concern that we have here in Nevada. All right. Aaron Ford, uh, Nevada Attorney General. Sir, we thank you so much for coming on with us. Good to talk to you. All right. Let's go to John Ralston, who is the dean of Nevada Political Reporting. Uh, John, let's cut to it. Nevada is still counting votes. Do you have a sense of how many are outstanding and where they're from? I mean, Biden has a lead right now, but it's, what, seven, 8,000 votes? It's not insurmountable, or is it? And no, it's certainly not insurmountable, Savannah. And you asked the right questions uh, there. The votes are mostly from Clark County, which is Las Vegas, uh, which is the Democratic stronghold and where the mail balloting uh, has been strongly in favor of the Democrats by a two to one margin. Uh, they don't know exactly how many votes uh, are, are out there. These are all mail ballots and so-called provisional same day registration ballots because a lot of them were dropped off yesterday during election day and they're still in uh, the, the these boxes about 375 of them that are being guarded in a warehouse and they're going to start counting them tomorrow and so uh, it, it is going to likely favor Joe Biden because uh, of the, if it being a democratic stronghold where the Republicans did not do very well in mail balloting but uh, since it's been such an odd year I don't want to say for sure uh, that, that that that's what's going to show but I can tell you this, uh, that, that both the Democrats and the Republicans here believe that those ballots will favor Joe Biden. Hey, uh, John, what would a recount look like in, uh, in Nevada? Well, uh, as, as I've said before, and this is typical of Nevada, right? We're such a permissive state. Anyone who loses uh, can, can demand a recount. And so that could happen. But I really think what we need to do before we get to that point, is that there's that 7,500 lead now. Let's see what it is after all of those ballots uh, are, are tabulated, including most of them tomorrow morning will be released from both Clark County and Washoe County, which is Reno, and a few from rural Nevada, where Donald Trump has done really well. It, it may be that Biden's lead is extended by enough that a recount won't make sense, or it could flip the other way, although I think that's much less likely. All right. John Ralston, uh, if this continues, I'm sending you a tripod for your next uh, live shot here with us yes, on NBC. Yes, I need one. Right <laughs> well, that, that was, was cold. That was, wow. that, I thought that was smooth. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it. He's a, he can take it. He can. Uh, Ralston, Hashtag he matters. He likes it when I <laughs> tease him. All right, John, thank you very much. Markets had a big day today in spite of all this uncertainty. Some insight on that from senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule, who speaks markets fluently. What do you make of what we saw uh, on the stock market today? Savannah, it was a really good day in the markets. It was right up there on your screen. The Dow was up 367 points, but it's not just today. All week, we've seen markets in the green, originally because investors were very excited about the idea of a blue wave. A blue wave would mean a big stimulus package, which is obviously good for the economy. Now, last night, when it was clear the race was a lot closer than people anticipated and that blue wave wasn't coming, we saw the markets take a leg down, and then they slid even further when the president spoke early in the hours last night, uh, prematurely and incorrectly claiming victory. But here's what's interesting. This morning, all that skittishness disappeared because the president's comments basically didn't get any traction. Joe Biden was slow and steadily ticking up electoral college votes. But what really sent markets surging was the Republican-led Senate. Because Republicans secured power in the Senate, the markets were thrilled, right? They like a stimulus package. They love a divided government. It will mean a smaller stimulus bill. However, with Mitch McConnell leading the Senate, it's going to be a lot harder for a Democratic president to push through big tax increases on corporate America, more regulations. And for markets, for corporate America, they like that. All right.
We have not officially called the Senate their outstanding races, but you're right, Stephanie, it does appear to be trending in a better direction yeah. for uh, Republicans. Yeah, no, it does, it does seem like at this point that at the very least it's going to be very hard for Democrats to take any massive sweeping action like what, what Stephanie uh, was talking about, although it does seem like we may be fighting for the Senate majority for another couple of months with two runoffs yeah. in Georgia, which is pretty tiring to think January. about for all of us right now. <laughs> well, we've never had a single special election, certainly in our generation, that would decide the control of an entire chamber. I mean, sure, we've had on a state level, and we could have two of them there. Um, we already know how easily now money gets thrown around in American politics. Just think about the amount of money that's going to get poured into Georgia, the amount, I mean, we're pouring over Georgia now as it is, and it's going to happen all over. hundred the million dollars in South Carolina on one Senate race. Right. We're talking, this is going to be a From quarter one billion candidate. dollars. Joking about it last night, the poor folks in Georgia who are sick of the political ads, sorry to tell you. They are in for it. it. It's on. Oh, my word. You go all streaming. Yeah, yeah. poor thing. Well, joining the conversation now are former Democratic Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill and conservative columnist and editor of National Review, Rich Lowry. Both are NBC News political contributors. Rich, I want to ask you about something. We were talking, I can't remember if it was late last night or, or this morning, but we were talking about uh, the president coming out and falsely uh, claiming victory. You were unhappy about that and, and, and all the, that comes with it. We saw Joe Biden come out several hours ago. He didn't claim victory, but he sure said it's in sight. Uh, I want you to respond to how, how he performed and, and why it's important to put on a game face for both of these candidates right now. Well, there's nothing wrong with saying that you think you're going to win. That's what most candidates always say. It's just different when you're the president of the United States and say you have won, and the fact that you might not win is a fraud perpetrated, perpetrated on the American public. Uh, that, that just president of the United States should never be undermining the process that way. And this, this is a, you know, it's a really close uh, election, obviously, Lester. It, it, just going to how close it is, if you just assume nothing flips now, that everyone who's leading in a state continues to lead in a state, Biden would win 270 to 268. And in that instance, the decisive uh, factor wouldn't be any state. It would be one single electoral vote out of a congressional district in Omaha. Because if that hadn't go to, gone to Biden and instead of gone to Trump, it wouldn't be 270 Biden, 268 Trump. It would be 269, 269. In that instance, presumably, Trump would ultimately win in a very contentious process that would go to the House of Representatives. Wow. Joe Maha is what the Nebraska <laughs> Democratic Party chair uh, has renamed it yesterday, Joe Maha. Well, you know, sometimes when you're covering politics and you ask yourself, why do they go to all that trouble for one single yeah, now you know. congressional district, yeah. one single electoral vote? Well, the answer is right there on the map. Let's bring Senator McCaskill into this. It looks like uh, they're going to unleash the lawyers. We're going to have a lot of fights. We're going to have recounts. We're going to have lawsuits. How should Joe Biden uh, conduct himself through this period, this sort of interregnum, to use an SAT word, uh, between now and, and whatever final result is declared? Well, I think he is going to continue to be very presidential. Uh, let's count the votes. Let's respect the law. They have a bunch of really good lawyers on site in all, in all these states. Uh, so do the Republicans. Both Democrats and Republicans are watching these counts. There's nothing nefarious going on out of sight of people who are monitoring. And, you know, Joe Biden is saying exactly what he said during this campaign. Let's re respect the institutions of law and democracy in this country. And it is quite a contrast. You know, I said today, just look at how the two campaigns behave today, and you can tell who's losing. All right. Claire McCaskill and uh, Rich, thanks very much. All right, we're going to take a little break. We'll be back right after this. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? 
Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. (laughs) Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time. If now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right and help you make sense of it all. Decision 2020, night two, and here is uh, some of the results, some of the uh, characterizations of the race. Pennsylvania, 20 electoral votes at stake. Too early to call there. Uh, Arizona, it is uh, too early, remains too early. Uh, Biden leads, and we've been told there will be another dump of of a lot of votes there, uh, probably in the next uh, half hour or so. So we're watching that. Yeah, we're on the air waiting for those Arizona results. They're supposed to come in tonight. In Georgia, it is too close to call, and you can say that again. Really too close to call. We'll keep watching that. In North Carolina, same deal. Too close to call, and it will be days, North Carolina officials tell us, before they count all of their votes. Uh, Nevada. Uh, perhaps a bit more, more narrow than a lot of folks anticipated. That is too close to call. Very tight there. Uh, and Alaska, it is uh, too early to call. All right. But uh, if you are keeping track at home, here's where the map to 270 stands right now. And you can see uh, a lot is filled in, but uh, the, the decisive states are still outstanding at this hour. And uh, Michigan Senate uh, Democrat uh, Gary Peters uh, wins. We'll hold on to his seat. Yeah, that was a squeaker. We just announced that. So here's the Senate at this hour, balance of power, but with the Georgia race so tight in the presidential, same thing, uh, there's two runoffs going uh, in Senate races in Georgia. So the balance of power, will it be the Democrats or the Republicans in control? That is to be continued as well. Look, I do want to point out, when, since we called Michigan, it is a pretty small, you know, it's not a, it's, it's, it's a, a small margin, but a pretty hard one to surmount, I know, uh, earlier today, uh, both Casey and I, I think we had sources clay, talking that there was a whole bunch of lawyers that were going to be sent to Michigan. They yep. thought maybe they could that they could find some votes there uh, for John James. In the, since you're in Michigan, in the presidential, yeah. what did the margin end up being? I know Michigan was called today. Right. Well, the margin now over 100,000 okay. votes, uh, as you can see here. But I want to point out something here because this, this was uh, – we did this county-to-county project this year where we picked these key counties. Uh, I'd like to think we did a pretty good job. We said, these are the five counties that we think will tell us how this presidential race is going to go. In Florida, we picked Miami-Dade. I think we uh, figured that out. In Arizona, we picked Maricopa. Uh, in uh, in, in uh, Wisconsin, we picked Milwaukee County. That is what put Joe Biden over the top. In Pennsylvania, it's Beaver. We're going to find out, did, did the president get enough from his territory to ca- carry Pennsylvania? We're finding there. And with Michigan, we picked Kent County. And that is what flipped. Uh, And this was a county that President Trump narrowly carried. This is Grand Rapids. This is the home of Gerald Ford. And you could, I mean, uh, for some people, I just, you could say the word Ford Republican. It stands for moderate Republican. It stands for suburban Republican. It stands for the Republican Party that is not today. And guess what? It had been moving, and you saw, and, 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 you know, and, and in fact, Obama actually, I think, did carry it in 08, if I'm not mistaken. Snuck it in there. But he lost it to Romney. Trump narrowly carried it. 
And here's Biden getting the most vote that a Democrat has gotten in Gerald Ford's home county. Anyway, it is just one of those, as we said, on one hand, we've seen rural America came out in full force for Donald Trump, but in the same forces that he's uh, been able to use to build himself up, it has driven suburban America, including Republican territory like Grand Rapids, Michigan, into the Democrats. And the result is tight races everywhere, Correct. all over that map. Gabe Gutierrez is in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where uh, Joe Biden has been declared the apparent winner by NBC News, but it appears to be headed straight for a recount. What do you know, Gabe? Uh, hi there, Savannah. Well, yes, the Trump campaign is threatening a uh, recount. And in order for the campaign to officially request one, they have to wait until the counties here officially certify those results. Now, that could take at least a week. The election officials would then have up to 13 days to actually conduct the recount. So. This probably, this might not finish here in Wisconsin until later this month. But Savannah, this is not the first time a recount has happened here in Wisconsin. It actually happened in the last presidential election. Four years ago, President Trump won, won Wisconsin by less than 23,000 votes. It wasn't the Clinton campaign that asked for a recount. It was actually uh, Jill Stein from the Green Party. Her campaign requested one, paid $3.5 million to force that recount. It obviously did not change the outcome, Savannah. All right, Gabe. Um, let's bring Casey into this and, and Chuck as well, because people do forget that in Michigan and Wisconsin, correct me if I'm wrong, there were recounts in both states in 2016. Right. Well, Jill Stein paid for one of them, technically. And that's, she did. Because yeah. the like person who challenges has to put the bill for the recount. Right. right. It got very, very, very expensive um, was for weird. her. It, that whole thing was weird. Was it even clear the Clinton campaign wasn't ready to want to recount? Suddenly that did in there, and of course the whole what was who what was funding Jill Stein? Who was funding Jill Stein? There's always been that that's still a black box. Let's yeah, just no, be. Right. But it, but yes, we had two recounts. But Scott Virginia. Walker, who is the the excuse me, the Republican former governor of Wisconsin, uh, put out a tweet today that was really interesting. Now he of course knows something about was. recalls, recounts, and Wisconsin <laughs> politics. What what was his perspective? And I mean, if you've listened to what Scott Walker has said over the last couple of years, I would have expected a, perhaps a pretty pugnacious response from him. But it was the opposite in this tweet. He he basically said, look, you go to a recount and it's a couple hundred votes, I can find you an example of where that recount might be successful, might change the outcome. But the 20,000, are we at 20,000 votes right 20, 000, now in yeah. Wisconsin? It, essentially, that's not something that you're going to overcome by demanding or paying for a recount. You have to find it. That, that's an error. You have to find a massive error. Yeah, a massive error. error. I remember in Florida, 50,000 votes during 2000, 50,000 votes, there was an overcount, a double count. And all of a sudden, yeah, that made up a whole bunch of ground. Um, yeah. But that that's your only but when, but you're when you're working five figures. But when you're working to undermine the, the, the vote, which is, which is what we've been seeing, does it matter that you win or does it matter that you show some mistake? Well, I guess the better way to look at it is let's take Wisconsin. If the president wants to win it, he somehow got to either find 21,000 votes for himself, I'm just doing basic math, or disqualify 20,000 votes fair's fair. of Joe Biden. If he's in the recount window, what's, what, oh, why, no, there's would, nothing wrong with why doing wouldn't it. he challenge it? But no, but the point is, is that that, that is really finding 20,000 ballots to disqualify. It's just very difficult. Right. Maybe and a it, signature match. It cost Maybe that stuff. Maybe dollars yeah. as well, because they would have to pay for it uh, in Wisconsin. Yeah, you have to pay for it yourself. You have to pay for it yourself. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. But I think the indication, all indications are that the Republicans do plan to pursue a recount count in Wisconsin. Uh, I, the, I don't know why you wouldn't if you believe. Yeah. I'm sorry. You, you're you're I, I, no politician. If you t legally can, why wouldn't you? Yeah. It, I mean, there's nothing fundamentally wrong about no. living within the law and trying to, to, to pursue a recount if it's so tight. It's uh, interesting, yeah. though, that Republicans are not pushing on this harder. It says to me they're backing off. All right. We will be right back with more coverage after this.
watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The winds fanning these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Welcome back uh, to our 2020 election. I was going to say election night, election night's coverage. Uh, here's uh, some of the races we're watching. The key battlegrounds, Pennsylvania, too early to call. And in Arizona, it's too early to call. We have said that Biden has a lead, and we await at this hour uh, a big release of votes. We spoke to the Secretary of State of Arizona, who told us there's approximately 600,000 votes outstanding in Arizona, that uh, the, most of them are from Maricopa County, that's suburban Phoenix, a key area area in Arizona, and she expects Maricopa County to re start reporting in two chunks tonight while we're on the air, uh, the results of those, which brings us to Chuck. Um, you, you know, so I, I, let's be transparent. Some news organizations have called yeah. this for Joe Biden already. I, we have not, in an abundance of caution, tell us about that process and that caution. decision. I don't even, I'll be honest, I, I just, if you've spent any time covering Arizona, you know that there's always ballots that are coming in. I go back to Martha McSally and Kirsten Cinema. That was the hot Senate race in 2018. Martha McSally led on election night. So if you'd called that on election night, five days later, you'd look silly. And we got a big chunk of vote on election night. You'd look silly. But people knew there's a lot of vote remaining. So, um, and I think it was only one or two news organizations that did it. I was surprised. It tells me that somebody that's not familiar with how Arizona works. Um, at the end of the day, that's, you know, why we didn't call it. You got to wait to see. Let's go to Maricopa here. I mean, because this is obviously, I think what we're going to see is we'll know based on, we're going to know based on whether Biden builds a lead here or his lead narrows just how much, where, where in Maricopa that vote comes from. But look, just so people realize, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. There is no guarantee that just because Biden is currently winning Maricopa, that all the new Maricopa vote is going to break 52-46 in Biden's favor. This is a county that Trump carried by three points. This is a county that Romney carried by 10 points. Now, Romney overperformed in Arizona because there's a key L, uh, uh, LDS vote, Mormon vote, um, that he was, and that to me was always one of, you're asking me what I think is the most intriguing cross tab that I want to dig into the exit polls in about three days um, after they've been reweighted. I'm very curious to see what the LDS community in Arizona did in this presidential, because normally it's a strong Republican uh, vote here, but it may explain, uh, we may find out, it may explain why Biden uh, carried Maricopa. We may see that he overperformed uh, with some Mormon voters. All right. There's also the McCain factor here, too. Remember, Cindy McCain, Cindy McCain yeah. jumped on board uh, with Joe Biden, and, and President Trump has attacked John McCain over and over and over again, and he's still very popular in his home state. Here. We want to uh, let's get to Phoenix right now, and uh, Gotti Schwartz is there for us. Uh, Gotti, give us the, the lay of the land. We, uh, we know this uh, dump of votes is going to come here uh, in the next half hour or so. That's right. It seems like so many people here in Phoenix and in Arizona, so many people across uh, the country are really looking at Maricopa County and in particular are looking uh, into the room that we're looking into right now. A little disclaimer, right before you guys came to us, there were a little flurry of activity in here. People were working very hard and then, of course, break time, people took a break. So this might be a little bit frustrating for people that are anxiously awaiting those results to come out of this room, but these poll workers uh, have been working diligently for quite some time. I'm going to show you what we're looking at here. Uh, these two machines right here, uh, these are some of the tabulation machines. They can punt, uh, pr push out about a six to 8,000 uh, ballots an hour. But getting those ballots into those machines takes quite a bit of work, and that's where the people come in. Uh, so what we were seeing earlier, uh, you guys were asking the Secretary of State about how the process works. When we were out, we kept seeing, on Election Day, people walking in with green envelopes. Those green envelopes were mail-in ballots that they got. They filled 
out at home and then they came in. The problem is, and it's not really a problem, it's just a function of the system here. When they fill those out, they turn them in, they walk away from them. It really takes a little bit more time to verify that they are the person that's voting. So they have to compare the different signatures. They do that here in this room. And then they have to prepare those ballots. One of the things that we've seen here is these people, these poll workers working together here in Arizona, just like many other states. It's one Democrat and one Republican. You see them getting along together, working to make sure that these votes are all counted accurately. And so that's what they've been doing throughout the day. The bad news is when it comes to those 400,000 votes that we are expecting to see pretty soon out of Maricopa County, what we're hearing is that the first batch may be 50,000 to 100,000, the second batch somewhere around those uh, lines as well. Uh, but we probably won't see those 400,000s for a couple of days. Not to put Back you to on you the guys. spot, Gotti, real quick, did they, do you have any indication on where in Maricopa County? I mean, I guess when you're waiting uh, with your, your breath held, you got to know right down to the, the street and the county and the zip code. Do you have any sense of that? Yeah, well, the, the frustrating thing is it's it's basically everywhere. So uh, they've counted the most. They've counted all of the early ballots, uh, and they've counted all of the 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 day of walk in, you know, fill out your ballot. But what they haven't calculated yet is those those green envelopes. The people that filled them out at home came in and handed them uh, to those poll workers at those polling sites or dropped them off in those boxes. So how do they verify so them if those people walk away? That's what's going on over the next couple of days. Yeah, how do they verify them if people I'm walk sorry? away? They, they, the, the green ones you're talking about, if, so people drop it off and then they walk away prematurely, do those get tossed out or how do they process them? They don't get tossed out. They're, they're meant to be dropped off. So they're, they're, you can drop them off at the, the ballot boxes or you can hand them to a poll worker. A lot of people wanted to make sure that their vote was being counted. So they, they didn't trust it going out in the mail. They wanted to physically do that handoff. Here's the thing. In order for the poll workers to know that that person is who they say they are, it all comes down to that ballot signature. And that's when things get really complicated with our election process, because we've got a secret ballot, and we also have to verify that they are the person that signed that ballot. So what they do here is they separate those two. They make sure that a signature matches uh, public records and other signatures. They actually have three different tiers here. They have a, a person that looks to make sure that the signatures look okay. If it looks a little bit fishy, they send it to a second team. That team has a little bit of forensic training. And then there's a third tier, which is these spot checks. So they make sure that those signatures are valid. Once they can confirm that those signatures are valid, then it gets uh, sent on to the people that are, are making sure that the ballots are ready for the tabulation machines. At that point, the signature has gone away. It is just a ballot. It goes into these machines, then they start cranking out those ballots, 6,000 to 8,000 ballots an hour in each one of these machines. And then soon enough, hopefully, we will have those uh, 400,000 outstanding ballots here in Maricopa County. They are saying they are not rushing. They're not rushing things. As you can tell, they're taking things very methodically. They don't see this as a delay. They see this as a part of the form and function of what they do here. So again, we're going to see some of those returns coming in in about half an hour, uh, but it's only going to be about 50 to 100,000 from what we're hearing, uh, then maybe another 50 to 100,000 a little bit later in the evening. Great deal. Uh, and then the next couple of days, we'll probably see some everything more. Great detail explanation. Yeah, I was going to say, everything you wanted to know about <laughs> ballots, but we're afraid to ask no, right I, there. I, I think Thank that you. Was Body. awesome. Thanks. Now Jody. we know. All right. Um, let's go to Pennsylvania. Rahima Ellis is there. She's in Philadelphia. Chris Jansing is in Harrisburg, the, the Pennsylvania capital. Two different stories going on. Let's start with you, Rahima. Well, here in um, Philadelphia, which is the largest city in the Keystone State, the, this place behind me has been now been dubbed the counting factory. This is where they are counting literally around the clock the mail-in ballots that have come in. As this morning, they, they were saying they had about two and a half million mail-in ballots, but this afternoon, uh, that was that's uh, statewide. This afternoon, they said that they are making a dent in that. In fact, they said out in Allegheny County, where Chris is right now, that they had uh, uh, processed about 68% of the mail-in ballots. And here in Philadelphia, they said they processed about 66% of those mail-in ballots. The interesting thing that's happening to you, too, is that from this morning, when the president tweeted out that we are winning Pennsylvania big, by this afternoon, his surrogates, including his son, one of his sons, Eric Trump, and his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, came here and filed a lawsuit trying to say they wanted to stop Pennsylvania from counting any ballots. They said, quote, that they are hiding the ballot counting and 
and processing from Republican poll watchers. But the governor of the state, who is a Democrat, Tom Wolf, said that they are absolutely transparent. At this voting facility or, or counting facility behind me, one of the things that they are doing is allowing cameras to be inside, and they're streaming what is going on. It's a little loud here. Hi. <laughs> I was enjoying the show behind you. Yeah, really. Uh, <laughs> Andrea had it too. A lot of said. I, I, I think they, they want. They wanted, they wanted to point out, I think, that there is a lot of activity going on there back here, go. so they've gotten our attention about all of that. Yeah. But the point is that they're saying that they are transparent about what's happening here, and they have said that there have been certified poll watchers, independent ones, those who are certified for the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party, and that they are ready to address any kind of court challenge to the transparency that they have going on here. They keep telling people, be calm, be patient, but also be calm. Confident that they're going to be transparent and every vote is going to be counted. Rahama, thanks very much. And let's go to Chris Jansing now in Harrisburg uh, with a, a, the view from there. You spent a lot of time in that part of the country recently. Uh, tell us what you're seeing and, and, and how people are reacting. Well, first of all, we're getting some new votes. We are expecting them to drop in Allegheny County very, very soon. They only have 20,000 left to count. They say they're going to get that done tonight, no matter what. They've been working around the clock. The Pittsburgh Steelers even sent dinner in for the workers, so they're raring to go until they get that last 20,000 done. That'll be a big, big indicator for Joe Biden, who believes he's going to do extremely well in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, the other thing the governor said, picking up on what Rahim uh, said earlier, is that this is kind of a stress test for democracy, and you can kind of feel the tension. Harrisburg is a state capital. People are used to the rough and tumble of politics, but this is really intense. The governor and the secretary of state held a press conference, and then over on the corner just behind me, one of the leaders, a Republican leaders of the Senate came out and once again called for the secretary of state to step down. There's been a lot of pressure on them. They say they're not going to bend to it. Tonight, 300, 350 people, demonstrators from unions, from progressive groups, went onto the steps of the Capitol just to show of support for Joe Biden, and especially for the governor and the secretary of state, asking that every vote be counted. And when I talk to a lot of political folks around here, they're already starting with the what ifs because they know that ultimately this could be a very tight race. They're talking about automatically um, having a recount at half a percent. Well, what if it's just near half a percent? Then we might have to bring in the military and foreign ballots, which don't have to come in until next week. So it may be a while before we actually figure everything out here in Pennsylvania, guys. Chris Chansing. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's go to Andrea Mitchell. She's holding down the fort in Philadelphia. Andrea, I know you've been working the phones. What are you hearing? Well, here in Philadelphia, I've got to tell you, and also out in some of the other, you know, more rural areas, the Democrats that I'm talking to are very confident about the margins they're seeing as this process goes on. They don't think they'll finish it till Friday, but they think they will finish it by Friday. And, you know, they're seeing big margins here in Philadelphia, certainly. Well, this is the, the biggest Democratic ratio of voters in the state, this in Allegheny County and Pittsburgh. But they're really seeing that people are adjusting to this mail-in process. The people are complaining about how slow it is. And there's a whole process where the ballots have to be certified, you know, sent to the state and back, and uh, a lot of people complaining about that process. In fact, uh, as we know, Joe Biden was talking to the Philadelphia officials here last night, you know, long-standing friends of his who were in Congress for a long time, former officials who were now running the, running the city Democratic Party, Bob Brady, who— uh, was a congressman for 21 years, and you know he's a little frustrated. Or he was asking, you know, what's going on with the count last night. But apparently, when Brady talked to him this afternoon, he was very upbeat, especially after the Michigan uh, Michigan returns came in, and that race was was called for him. So uh, apparently, and you saw Biden today, very, very. Uh, very much more confident than he was last night when they were really on pins and needles about Pennsylvania. So, as Lester was referring to earlier in the evening, these lawsuits are coming, and the Republicans were here today, Giuliani and Eric Trump, but they're pretty confident that they can get through it because the count has to be done before the actual legal challenges. That's what Bob Bauer and the whole legal team surrounding Bob, you know, Joe Biden say. You've got to count the votes, then you can start challenging them. 
Yeah, that's the process. Uh, Andrew, I'm glad you brought that up because that's where we're turning next, what those legal options are for the campaigns in those tight, tight races. Here with some answers, Justice Correspondent Pete Williams, Duke University Law Professor Guy Charles, who is an uh, expert in election law. Pete, let's start with you because you can set the scene. Uh, as you've been reminding us, we don't have to wait for some cases to get to the Supreme Court. In at least one case in Pennsylvania, it's already there. Uh, how do you see this terrain as we sit here tonight? So that's the lawsuit in which the Republicans are saying that the ballot deadline should not have been extended by the state Supreme Court and that only the state legislature can do it. Now, that sits there on the Supreme Court's doorstep. It has not decided whether to hear that appeal. If Pennsylvania could make a difference, if the votes, you could, you could probably switch enough votes if you went to court, uh, you'd have to say to yourself how many ballots actually came in during that extended period. That would be the place where the Republicans would go and try to breathe new life into that lawsuit. But the rest of the lawsuits that this, the Republicans have filed around the states, and I think there's seven or eight of them now in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, and Georgia, they're all kind of nibbling away at the margins. None of them, as the president said last night, seek to stop the vote counting. Other lawsuits in Pennsylvania say, for example, that the ballots were not handled right or voters were given, uh, they shouldn't have been given the chance to come in and fix any problem with their mail-in ballots. Uh, or the uh, right IDs aren't there, that kind of thing. Observers aren't getting a chance to look at the process well enough. Uh, and machines shouldn't be used to verify signatures. Uh, the way ballots are duplicated, if they're damaged, should be more closely watched. Uh, you know, just to give you an example of the, of the sort of way that th these lawsuits are kind of, as I say, nibbling at the margins, just a short time ago, the Republicans filed a lawsuit uh, in Pennsylvania saying, Hey, the counties, the state's got it wrong on how many days you have to come in and, and supply missing proof of identification if it's not there. They've added three extra days. They shouldn't have done that. So that's the kind of thing we're seeing in terms of these lawsuits. Nothing that would stop the count anywhere. Yeah, let me ask Professor Charles, how much latitude do the courts typically give the local election, you know, county level, state level folks? Um, plenty of latitude, Lester. I mean, as Pete said, the problem for the campaign is that it has to identify a legal violation, um, either to stop the count or to, to, or to get into court. So there will be plenty of latitude here for the state officials. And as uh, your reporters have said, they're all being extremely careful to make sure that they're counting the votes in a manner that is not going to violate anyone's rights or, or the law. So as long as they're behaving consistent with the law, then it's going to be extremely difficult to challenge their decisions, especially where the, they're given some discretion in making those decisions. All right, Professor, thank you. I bet we'll be back with you as the days go on. Pete, you can bet on it. Uh, our special coverage of Decision 2020 continues in just a moment. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line, but who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail at the center today. of this campaign. Coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The winds fanning these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. <laughs> Every morning on today.
Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. Wisconsin. Now, NBC has declared Joe Biden the apparent winner. Why is it apparent and not the projected winner? Because the margin is just so close. T difference of 20,000 votes, which brings it uh, likely within the margin if you want to pursue a recount on behalf of the Trump campaign. And every indication is that they will. By the way, when we do apparent can. winner, yes. if you notice, it said 99% in. We never say 100 for that when we do apparent. Because what we're saying is, we think this is all the vote there is, but we don't know for sure. We don't know if there's another error. We don't know if there's something more that comes in, so we're not going to sit here. It's, it's why it, well, you'll never see 100 on an apparent call. Okay. And that, that is why, because I'm sure some people are going, well, well, there's 1%, and sometimes you're like, what is that 1%? Could that 1% be 30,000 votes, or that 1% 3,000 votes? Um, but in this case, it's apparent simply because we're being careful. Let's show you some other boards, including uh, Arizona, which we've, we've been watching since last night, and that uh, would seem like a, you know, Biden out in front here. But we have. Uh, uh, we're moment. We're looking at Wisconsin. We're but looking at Wisconsin. To your point, yeah. Lester, we are. I was going to say, I thought, wow, did that go? Yeah, I got thrown yeah. there. No, <laughs> ten minutes away from Arizona releasing new numbers. Let's focus on Wisconsin for a moment because it does seem that that state is headed for recount territory. We want to bring in NBC News contributor Jeremy Bash, and as we said before, he's a veteran of these wars. He was there at the. Florida recount in 2000, a young lawyer working for then Democratic candidate Al Gore, and also with us, Chief White House correspondent Hallie Jackson, who of course is familiar with the legal strategy of the Trump campaign. Um, let's start with you, Hallie. Let, what is there any doubt at all that recounts will be pursued by the Trump campaign wherever they can be? Yeah, at this point, that is the strategy, Savannah, kind of a, sh a shock and all legal strategy, frankly. You look at some of these states, so in Wisconsin, and we should note this, that technically the, the Trump campaign cannot actually file that recount yet. They are threatening to do so. They are saying they are planning to do so, but that can actually get triggered for another few days. So just to be clear on that, it's not as though that paperwork has begun because it can't be. That said, they are pursuing that strategy in Wisconsin because it is potentially, depending on how these states fill out that are currently uncalled, uh, uh, could make a difference for them. You also look at Pennsylvania and the legal strategy there. Just in the last couple of minutes, between the time you were talking with Pete Williams about the legal strategy and the time that we're talking now, the Trump campaign filed yet another lawsuit. They have, according to the RNC, some 500 volunteer lawyers in that state alone, multiple firms on retainers. It is a full cart press. It is also not an unexpected one. This is something that has been foreshadowed for several weeks now as the Trump campaign has been looking at the numbers, as it seemed as though this race was going to be extremely close, as they want to pursue this sort of, you know, battleground blitz, if you will, when it comes to these challenges. I have to tell you, based on some conversations that I've had tonight, um, I, I spoke with one person close to the campaign. There, There is some discomfort, I think, in some circles about the strategy that is being pursued because of who is leading that strategy. I think outside of the president's immediate orbit, there are those who are looking at people like Rudy Giuliani uh, and, and those who appeared in Philadelphia today and wondering if they are perhaps the best suited people to be pursuing this kind of strategy, if it is, in fact, to be a serious one. So that's kind of where we are with Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And I want to mention one other state. I know we're teeing up to the top of the hour here in Arizona, where we expect to get that ballot dump from Maricopa County. And I want to give you some clarity and some insight into why the Trump campaign thinks that they're going to do potentially very well here. It's one thing to say it, but here's some back of the envelope math, right? We heard from the Arizona Secretary of State earlier in this broadcast that there are about 600,000 roughly ballots, votes they think estimated to be still out there. The Trump campaign believes 
believes that President Trump could get, based on the numbers they have seen so far, something like 60 percent of those returns coming out of the support that's still left. That's, listen, an ambitious number, but they say that that is what they're seeing based on the data. If you do the math, if you work out the numbers, that would, with the difference being 92,000 right now, that is why the Trump campaign thinks that they could be over by the end of the, the ballot counting in Arizona by about 30,000 votes. They don't expect to see that tonight. They don't expect to see it tomorrow, which I think is Thursday. They're looking at maybe Friday to be able to see some of those numbers coming in from Arizona. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of why the Trump camp thinks that it could go in their direction at this point. Again, 60 percent number is a question mark, particularly as Chuck knows, and Savannah, as you know well with Arizona, on where the, the count is coming in. But that's the thinking inside uh, folks that I've been talking to. All right, Hallie. So let's turn to Jeremy Bash. We uh, gave his resume uh, on the recount issue. So what comes to mind, Jeremy, when you're talking about recounts, you're looking at Wisconsin, potentially Georgia, uh, potentially Arizona, potentially Nevada. Uh, what are the considerations, whether you're the Trump campaign or the Biden campaign? Because we've, we may see those challenges on both sides. Well, Savannah, first of all, you can't recount votes that you haven't first counted. So, for example, for the Trump campaign in Pennsylvania and Georgia, where the votes are still being counted, they have no mechanism to ask for a recount because the votes haven't been counted. And it certainly wouldn't do the Trump campaign much good in Michigan and Arizona to ask for a recount or even to stop the counting of the votes, because, of course, they're behind the Biden campaign, which I guess brings us back around to Wisconsin and just, again, looking at the math. If Trump tr is trailing Biden in Wisconsin by about 20,000 votes, it is almost impossible during a recount to overcome a deficit of 20,000. In the Florida recount in 2000, which you referenced, Gore was down by about 1,000 votes after the initial recount. And at the end of the day, at the end of the recount, he was trailing by 500 votes. So he made up only about a net of 500. The idea that Trump could make up 20,000 in Wisconsin, I think, is pretty strained. What's what's the end game then? Why why pursue the strategy of recounts if if you don't think it's going to move the needle and 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 take you across the finish line? Any port in a storm, Lester. Joe Biden is on the cusp of 270. If Arizona goes his way and Nevada goes his way, he's the president of the United States, and he said so much today in his remarks. And I think the Trump campaign is looking for something, anything to hold on to, a desperate attempt to change the dynamic here. All right, Jeremy, thank you. Casey, uh, you know, it'll be interesting because I think Hallie put it well. It's a scorched earth legal strategy for the Trump campaign right now. And there's two tracks. There's the recount track where it's available to them, and it's the lawsuit track. And Pete Williams decide, uh, described how there's, you know, it's piecemeal. It's a, a thousand cuts, right? A lawsuit here, a lawsuit there. There's no one single lawsuit that you file against the entire election. That's not how we vote. Where do you think Republicans in Congress will come down as this goes on. Um, you know, they obviously have just learned through the election that supporting the president and hugging the president is good politics for them. They have, Savannah, but I actually, I've been watching this pretty closely over the last 24 hours to try and answer exactly this question. Were they going to join the president in, in calling into question the results? And so far, you haven't really seen it. And part of that is, you know, Republicans have done pretty well. They uh, have held on to more sense seats than they anticipated. They've won more House seats. And if you're calling into question the results of the election, you're calling those results into question as well. So there's a little bit of tension for them. And I, I do think that there is not a willingness, and, and this is kind of what I've been trying to test. Before this election, I was picking up a real um, unwillingness to trash the Republican Party brand completely, throw it out the window in favor of Donald Trump if he was going to lose big. And my question was, OK, if he didn't lose that big, uh, would they still do it? It seems to be holding so far. All right. Uh, we're going to take a pause right here. We're almost at the top of the hour, 9 o'clock Eastern time, 7 o'clock uh, out in the Mountain West. Why do we mention the Mountain West? Because that's where uh, the, the eyes of the political universe will be focused. Arizona about to release uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of ballots tonight. And the first batch will come in moments we expect. We'll be here. Much more to come. We continue our live coverage, Decision 2020, right here on NBC.
watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The winds fanning these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Continuing coverage of 2020 as we uh, wait for a new batch of numbers from Arizona. But we want to show you where things stand right now. Pennsylvania, obviously, uh, looming large here. Too early to call, uh, according to NBC News. Nevada, uh, that's also too close to call right now. 86% expected vote there. We await more votes and more results from Nevada tomorrow morning, bright and early. In Georgia. Georgia down at below 40. Look okay. at that thing. Keeps dipping down. All right, because they're still counting votes in Georgia. Predominantly, those Georgia are coming from the Atlanta suburbs, which is why uh, Joe Biden is starting to eat into that margin. We'll keep an eye on that one. North Carolina, too close to call. This one is another uh, by, a, by a hair. We'll watch that one. Ballots still coming in probably as late as next week in North Carolina. Alaska, it is uh, too early to call the presidential race. And once again, that brings us to Arizona, where we are expecting uh, sometime uh, around now, sometime in this half hour, uh, uh, a new group of numbers, and many of them coming from Maricopa County. Yeah, so let's go put the map up. This is it, the road to 270. You see where it stands tonight. And the focus right now on Arizona. Chuck, let's talk about it. Are you clicking refresh on your computer? I, I am. Seeing <laughs> if the... Uh, the votes are coming in. Well, here's what I want to. Yes, They're I have coming been, from all over Maricopa the way, County tonight. I, I have been doing get. that um, with both with both Georgia and and Arizona. Look, I know we're going to bring our pollsters in, and, and like I said, one of our uh, Bill McIntyre, the Republican half of our team, does a lot of work in Arizona. Knows it really well. Has done work for Senator McCain, for Governor Ducey there. And I just want to remind folks. Let's go in. I mean. Maricopa, this is a relatively new blue county, right? I mean, this is, I want to just show you a little bit of history here. You know, this, and, and you know, if you win Maricopa, you win the state. There's, there's, a, 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 there's an example out there of somebody who narrowly lost it by like a thousand votes and won a statewide race. But for the most part, you can't win statewide without winning Maricopa because it's such a large, populous county. This is a re this is basically like a lot of the suburban counties in America. It has been trending from uh, a lean red to a lean blue, and you can just see it here. As you can see, Joe Biden. So we don't know. We can't sit here and assume that any of this vote, the way we've seen it in the Atlanta suburbs and the Philly suburbs, those are those are huge margins. Those are 70-30, 80-20. I don't expect that here. This is why we don't know where in Maricopa. Maricopa is a county state. I mean, there are pockets of Maricopa. There are really blue pockets of Maricopa, really red pockets of Maricopa. And one thing the Secretary of State, and I think we tried to prod it out, or hey, can you tell us where? Uh, is this coming from, you know, from Arizona State, or is this coming from Scottsdale, right? Like, that's, that's the issue here, and this is why, ooh. I just saw some numbers move. I, when I see the numbers roll, I know. it is actually coming in. I just saw numbers move. That means um, it's it's all happening. So we should be getting okay. some numbers as it comes in. I just saw, yep, see, you can, um, oh, no, that's the statewide vote. So okay. we'll be watching. Keep an eye on it. Yep. Uh, you mentioned our pollsters. Let's go to them. Uh, and and I, we've got Bill McInturf, who is uh, one of our pollsters for NBC News Wall Street Journal. He's a Republican. We also have Democratic pollster Jeff Horwitt of Heart Research Associates. So we got all the bases covered. Bill, let's go right to you. Um, so we know that we're expecting, well, there's 600,000 votes outstanding in Arizona, we learned from the Secretary of State, approximately uh -huh. 400,000 of which are from Maricopa County. And we're going to start to see those uh, perhaps dumped out in batches this evening. What do you make, uh, you know, what do you make of where they're coming from? If you, would you rather be Joe Biden in this moment or Donald Trump? Well, I, gosh, I hate to say this as the Republican, but you'd rather be Joe Biden. You're up 95,000 votes. There's 600,000 votes left. You've got to win the outstanding vote by about 18% to break even. But here's why that's possible. 
because Republicans drop their ballots off in person. And if you look at the Election Day vote, all, all across Arizona yesterday, people who voted on Election Day, they were voting for Trump by either 20 to 40 point margins, depending which county they're in. So these ballots include, as you were hearing, the green ballots, people dropping them off in person. And so when the Trump people say, hey, we could be up 20, they might. And this could, I think it will get closer, whether you can make up 95,000 votes, I think that's that's a that's a lift, but it's it's what makes America great. It's interesting. <laughs> and Jeff, I guess the same question to you: Where do the uh, where do the Trump folks see those see those numbers? Are they real or are they fool's gold? Well, again, I think this first batch, uh, you know, we'll, we have to wait and see. And uh, you know, I, but we do know, you know, that a lot of the vote that's out, whether it's Arizona or other places, you know, the projections are there about 21 million votes still out there. And we need to make sure that they're counted. And uh, what we do know, what we've seen in other places, whether it's North Carolina or Georgia uh, or Pennsylvania, that the vast, vast majority of the vote that's still out there is this early vote, uh, which, uh, given how divided our country is and how we voted, we know that that is uh, a vote that is much more likely to go for Joe Biden. So we'll see how this first <clears throat> group of, of votes go in Arizona, but there are more to come. And if they're early vote, that's a good good sign for Joe Biden. Bill, give us a little bit of a taste of Maricopa. You've you've uh, I I was bragging on your work there. You've done a lot of work for over a decade in Arizona, so you've had to navigate Maricopa from a Republican point of view as it's been shifting away from the Republicans. So, you know, I'm, I'm, there are good parts of Maricopa for the Republicans. There are good parts of Maricopa for the Democrats. So, walk us through it a little bit of what's been changing and 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 what you know could be your expectation. All right, so you remember that great line, you never put your hand in the same river twice? Maricopa is not the Maricopa of four years ago. Arizona has gone through an economic boom. Uh, good, God bless my governor, uh, Doug Ducey. But you know what's happened? One, there's been a high tech boom in Tucson and in, and in all across Maricopa. There's been new jobs created. More than one out of three people in Maricopa County weren't said they registered in the last four years. So you've got, uh, and you've got Generation Z and millennials moving to the Mountain West. And then lastly, of course, you have a Latino population that's aging into the electorate. And so sort of like everything you think you know about Arizona from four years ago, this is a very different state. Um, and, and what you're watching is real, which is Arizona moving from a red state to truly a, a, a toss-up state as Arizona has changed demographically. And that's the big thing that you're seeing here in Arizona right now. Let's go to Gotti Schwartz. Gotti's on the ground there uh, at, at one of the places where the, 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 the ballots are being uh, processed and assessed. Gotti, I, I know you're clicking refresh. Do you got any new numbers for us? Yeah. yeah, I've been clicking refresh on my uh, cell phone. I'm going to try to show you this, if, if you can see it. Uh, but this just came in. We know that it's a, a bump, a slight bump for Biden. The total votes now are 887,000. Uh, and then this is Trump Pence down here, 802,000. So uh, we're trying to do a little bit of the number crunching ourselves, uh, just looking at uh, what it was before. My math is horrible, but uh, right now we know that the updated results show uh, 1.7 seven to nine million votes out here. Uh, so uh, th again, th we, we know that there were about uh, 400,000 votes still outstanding. Now this dropped down to about 300 or so thousand. So that batch may have been about 100,000, like what we were talking about a little bit earlier, maybe 70,000. We're still going to do the math there, but it does show uh, that uh, Biden has gotten a little bit of a bump from this. And remember, when we're talking about 500,000 votes uh, and 500,000 votes, ballots that are still out there, and the race is getting closer and closer. We were doing uh, some more math, and it looked like President Trump, if he wanted to, to win the vote here in, uh, in Arizona, he would need about six out of every 10 people that have dropped off these ballots to be voting for him. And what we've seen now is about this 70, 60, 70,000 uh, batch hit, and it doesn't look like there were many more votes for Trump. And Instead, it gave just a little bit of a, a smidgen of a bump to Biden. So we're going to continue to to do some math here on the, all these different screens. I know that you guys are, are tabulating back at 30 Rock with some much bigger screens. So hopefully you guys will have a little bit of better math. Uh, but also, we've got.
got people back. Yeah. If you can take a look here, they are back. They are crunching those numbers. That's what, you, what I was talking about a little bit earlier. That's the bipartisanship. One person Democrat, one person Republican. They become friends through, throughout this entire process. And they are verifying, uh, they're, they're basically uh, verifying those ballots, making sure that everybody is staying within the lines or making sure that they know exactly which candidate was selected before they put it into these tabulation machines. Uh, that takes a, quite a long time. So this is a process that is uh, slowly but surely moving. We've got a little bit of a trickle coming out. We should have another batch hitting in about two hours. But this is not the earth an earth-shattering news that we were expecting. <laughs> So much is going to happen in this room right yeah. here, and it could decide uh, the rest of this election. Savannah. Okay. Thank you, Gotti. Do you have? What, what do you think, Chuck? Do you, you, we don't have anything on our map. We have nothing right? yet, and okay. you know, one of the ways, you know, when when we do this, our folks like to go over the. We don't just pour the data in our mm -hmm. system because, again, we actually found this um, last night. Uh, if you were following the Virginia results for some reason, it's my my adopted home state these days. I was days. briefly. Right. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, found, we thought we found an error in their Fairfax, and when Fairfax um, uh, delivered their vote, we thought they may have double counted something. So we sent it. We were like, no, 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 we're not putting in our, we're like, put it in. Whoa, we took it out of the system um, and said, hey, we need to go through this, make sure there isn't double counting going on. And there was a lot of concern of double counting this year, not because People would do it on purpose. You're just dealing with a lot more mail-in votes yeah. and all this. And so there's always been, we know there's multiple categories now of stuff. So that's, we're, when we get this vote, we don't just put it into the system, right? We do actually vet it ourselves. Well, and let's just take one quick second. Those folks behind Gotti Schwartz and the people across the country that are doing all of this tabulating who are, you know, probably making mistakes. They're dealing with so much. They're out working for all of us in this pandemic. I, I don't know. I just... I, the whole country saying, thinking, are you finish it? Yeah. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but on. we By should be way, saying thank you. Think, we really think, should. Yeah, and it's thankless at times. It they don't really get, is. They don't get thanked. They get browbeated. Yeah. Let's well, we say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's bring in uh, former Democratic Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill and conservative columnist and editor of National Review, mm -hmm. Rich Lowry. Both are NBC News political uh, contributors. Uh, Claire, I'm just curious. Uh, this is a, a, a moment we're all watching these uh, these numbers trickle in, uh, and, and certainly both campaigns are right now. Is this one of the gut check moments along the way to, to 270? Well, I think it is, although this is quite a margin they would have to overcome. I mean, these votes would have to be pretty lopsided for Trump to take the lead in Arizona. And I spent the afternoon on the phone with a lot of my former colleagues, and nobody knows states better than the senators that are from those states. When you have to run statewide, you know it like the back of your hand. There's a lot of comfort about what's going to come in Nevada, and there's tremendous confidence about Pennsylvania at this point. I was surprised how confident people were about Pennsylvania ending up in Joe Biden's column. Uh, and the recount stuff is kind of weird. I've never seen a recount be successful when there's tens upon thousands of votes difference between the two candidates. I frankly don't get it. Usually it's the recounts that matter are when you're within a thousand votes of each other. And, and Rich, uh, you want to weigh in on the, on the recount idea, um, you know, the risk reward? And the recounts, I mean, unless it's razor, razor thin, you know, 100 votes, 200 votes, you're, you're just not going to overturn a result. And Arizona is really key here for Trump's path, which has diminished over the last 12 hours or so. And I, I think really the, the most plausible path, perhaps the only path, is holding Pennsylvania, which is going to be tough. I've talked to Republicans in, in Pennsylvania who uh, Claire's friends are optimistic. My friends in Pennsylvania are pessimistic. They're not sure Trump can hold on in, in Pennsylvania. But he needs to hold on in Pennsylvania, hold on in Georgia, which is going to be real close, hold on in North Carolina, and somehow flip either Arizona and Nevada. And Arizona would seem the most likely. And just if, if Arizona goes to Biden, this will be a sign that Trump his electoral path, although it worked for him in, in 16, it's come really close this time, might even end up working for him this time. It's just too narrow. You, there are suburbs all over the country. You know, part of the problem with the Obama coalition, when Obama wasn't on the ballot and blowing the doors off in terms of turnout, it was maldistributed geographically. It was too coastal, it was too urban. But there are suburbs everywhere. 
and the Republican Party will have to figure out a way going forward to still appeal to these Trump-based voters. They're part of the Republican coalition going forward, but not to be uh, so hated in the suburbs. That's just not sustainable. It's so interesting to me to look at the map and just take a moment and just, you know, we've got little embers burning in several different states. I mean, there's a story going in multiple states. We remember Florida, Florida, Florida. Now it's Arizona, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. There's so much going on in this map. And Claire, you know, here we are entering this transition period and this period of uncertainty. And, you know, what are your concerns about how these days and weeks will proceed while there is still uncertainty about the result here? Well, I'll be honest with you, Savannah. My biggest concern right now is any damage that might be done to the essence of our democracy. Um, you know, people need to have faith that their votes count. Uh, we have been the city on the hill when it comes to a democracy that allows every vote to count equally to every other vote. And what the president did last night is unprecedented, as we've said many times about this president, but it's really corrosive to the democracy that we hold dear. And I worry most about the damage that the president could do to the democracy trying to undermine the results of this election between now and next January. Rich, what do you think uh, Republicans uh, in leadership will do as this plays out, if there's concern over, um, it, look, asking for a recount, if it's within his rights, you know, right. uh, you can question or, or debate the strategy, but if it's within his rights, it's within his rights. Filing lawsuits, if it's within its rights, it's within his rights. But what do you think Republicans um, in leadership, like a Mitch McConnell, for example, will think about this strategy? Well, I think if it becomes anything more serious, you'll get s some more serious pushback from Republicans who are mostly just cringing privately now. And the chances are that the president's Bark is going to be worse than his bite here. You know, he, I, I don't like what he's saying on Twitter. I don't think he should say it. Um, but in terms of the legal strategy, so far it's been penny ante lawsuits about getting election observers into these counts when, according to reporting, the observers are already there. So that's it's just not really going to affect things one way or the other. And I think that the biggest potential, as we were talking last night, for really consequential uh, litigation would be in Pennsylvania if it's extremely close and it goes to these late arriving absentee ballots. That could really go up to the Supreme Court and be a highly contentious case. But uh, maybe Pennsylvania is not that close. Maybe Trump wins Pennsylvania. You know, he's not going to sue over Pennsylvania if he actually wins it, and he can win Pennsylvania, and Biden still has a path. So uh, I think we just need to wait to see, see how it plays out. All right. Uh, Rich, Claire, th thanks to both of you as always. And we're going to take a break right here. We'll be back. More coverage, more numbers when we can. Okay. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center today. of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. Every morning on today. Police murder 
of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time. If now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. Well, for the moment, the uh, big storyline here is Arizona. We have been watching and calling that one too early to call, but as promised, uh, Arizona officials are releasing a, a batch of new numbers, and our, our friend Chuck has been checking them out at the board. Yeah, look, we, when we began the night, uh, our difference here was 92. Uh, thousand uh, was the difference between the two statewide. Well, you can see now the new batch of numbers was about 90,000 ballots that came in. Uh, and the, the president uh, netted about uh, 14, 13 to 14,000 votes, which is why the difference is down to 79. So that means he's been winning. He's winning. The president it, shrunk the lead. Shrunk the lead. Has. And, you know, that means he won it by about 18 points, uh, anywhere from 18 to 20, that batch of ballots. Put it this way. Um, we're waiting for the next batch before we feel comfortable taking a look again and see if we can call this. If, if he's going to be able to eat into, with all, if all these batches were equal as they came in, then, you know, you could see uh, this situation change. But we don't know if it will be this sort of equal as each batch comes in. We'll wait for the next batch. But this was a good batch for the president. It netted him about 13,000 votes. Okay. The reality is really, I mean, the Biden campaign has been counting on Arizona as they've been thinking through the scenarios, what their paths are on the map. And I've had a bunch of sources say they're very confident about this, but I think this is rattling some nerves right now. Did the uh, Trump, were the, the Trump folks side. looking at Arizona prior to? Where yeah, I mean, and now. Hallie has has been reporting tonight that they are optimistic about it. And, and certainly, I mean, there there are are reasons to think uh, that the, the president, you could see some of the same uh, dynamics in terms of the rural areas of the state. But, you know, as we've been talking about the suburban realities in Phoenix and the, the, how much that has changed in this state, really, uh, I think is what has given uh, Democrats so much confidence. And, and the Senate race as well. I mean, we expect Mark Kelly to win the Senate race there. The Democrat uh, has also given them uh, some hope. But, you know, these, these are some, some new questions, I think, that are, that are being explored the now. The reason it ballot. matters is and if you put up the map to 270, uh, and, and, the, it really, and that's why you saw the Trump campaign so um, unhappy last night that other networks had called Arizona for Biden. Because when you put the map up, you know that if Arizona goes for Biden and he's picked up that one extra electoral vote in Nebraska, that's the striped state on our map, then Biden would no longer need Pennsylvania. Right, and assuming he picks assuming up Nevada, he gets as Nevada. Well. Right. So that is why these Mountain West states have become so critical to the Biden campaign. It's giving them a cushion with or without Pennsylvania. That's why everyone is hanging on Nevada right. and Arizona right, right now, Chuck. But by the way, and this is where even as Trump gets good news in Arizona, he's not getting good news in Pennsylvania. This number keeps coming down. But it's a no. vote, do you still get new votes there? We're still getting some trickle in, and it's down to 190,000. Point is, is that it, it is, you know, which, again, I always just take you to Philly, where we have no new votes. You know, 190,000, he can, it, it keeps shrinking as stuff comes in. Biden can end up basically picking this up. Um, well, Philly's, Philly's the big one, Philly and Delaware. Um, could be enough alone to make up that margin. This is why all of the, you heard Rich and Claire sharing their sources. I'm hearing the same thing. I think you're hearing the same thing. Ton of Democratic bullishness, Republican pessimism about this. So you yeah. realize, I mean, I, I mean, go to our map here. I mean, you put you put Pennsylvania blue, um, and it, we don't, we don't, Arizona doesn't matter. Uh, right, for, for him right now. Neither does Nevada. Neither does Georgia. Neither does North Carolina. That's suddenly a pretty... And then everything else becomes gravy for Biden. So as good news for the president here, this is not shaping up very well in Pennsylvania right now. Yeah, the only I mean, the, the, the challenge, of course, obviously, is that if we if if 
there are legal fights in Pennsylvania. There are, there are already cases that uh, are headed uh, for the Supreme Court that relate to what counts as a legal ballot in Pennsylvania. Uh, the president's strategy is more developed in terms of trying to fight that. I mean, and we could be bogged down in Pennsylvania. Right, right. If, if you're it rooting is that for close. resolution and peace, you don't <laughs> right. want Pennsylvania to be the linchpin because it's going to be an all out legal war, and all of the seeds of that are already present. There is already a case before the Supreme Supreme Court that was tabled, but has it's a, has the ability to be resuscitated and brought back to life if it becomes relevant, which it would if Pennsylvania ends up being the linchpin of someone's victory. Yeah. Because Casey's husband and I like lived in Florida again, uh, at least <laughs> mentally. Florida, Florida, Florida. Would Casey's be husband a lot of it. a producer here producer at NBC at News. At NBC and meet the press. Uh, and it really reminded me: you cannot. This recount strategy does not work in multiple states. OK, it is one state. In fact, you know, there at that during that 2000 election, there was some thought that the, the, the Bush campaign at the time thought, hey, maybe we ought to ask for a recount in New Mexico. If I remember, New Mexico was was one that was really tight. Um, and maybe we ought to ask for a recount in Iowa. Iowa Gore had carried it really tight. And the idea was, well, you're going to do that. We're going to do that. And then they said, no, 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 no. This is this is the 270. Let's go. If you're just if you're all over the map. You're not gonna. You're not gonna win the narrative. I hate to say that. You're not gonna. You know. You make it about one state. You might be able to concentrate all the energy. You concentrate all the focus. You concentrate all the political sort of strength of, of your side or the other into that one state. The president's problem is, you know. All right, I'm gonna try Wisconsin. I'm gonna right. try Arizona. I'm gonna try Pennsylvania. And I, I just, you know, it doesn't. It, it's not gonna look legitimate. Well, and this is why I think what the president is saying about this is so important because the frame that gets put on this is something that's going to matter. He is creating a reality for the people who support him. And, I mean, part of, I think, for those people that you mentioned, Savannah, who are wishing for resolution, I think there's an acknowledgement that going through something like what we went through in Florida in 2000 in Pennsylvania in this scenario would be something that would really be incredibly divisive and difficult for the country and for all of us. And, uh, you know, I think it's part of why also the, the Biden campaign strategy is important to, play, to pay attention to until we have a resolution in these Mountain West states, because, you know, you have seen the former vice president be very careful in coming out today and saying, you know what, I expect to win this race, but I'm not going to come out and tell you that I have until I know that I have. Let's uh, bring in quickly Hallie Jackson joining us in the White House to talk more about Arizona. And as she had, uh, you'd reported earlier, uh, the Trump folks were seeing something there that the Biden folks weren't seeing. And it, it may be starting to appear in the numbers. What's the what's the read in the White House? Well, I mean, that's it, Lester, right? They're looking at these sort of batches of data coming in, just like everybody else, and looking to see, as Chuck is talking about, how tight that's going to get. And can they keep up that sort of roughly 60 percent number? It's technically, I think, right around 57 percent they've calculated is what they're going to need from the remaining ballots coming in. So if they can consistently keep that, then I think they're feeling good about their chances, continue to feel good about their chances, specifically in Arizona. But to Chuck's point here, and I was listening with interest to the conversation with Rich Lowry just a couple of minutes ago, because I think Rich laid out exactly what the campaign is seeing as their path. They've got to hold Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina, and then get Arizona, be able to sort of flip that, or Nevada, although it looks like at this point Arizona is the potentially likelier bet. We obviously haven't called either race. Um, one of the things, though, that Chuck has mentioned, as they are feeling, I think, more comfortable, feeling more optimistic about Arizona, there's the Pennsylvania question, and then there's the Georgia question. You know, this is a state that I think 48 hours ago, 72 hours ago, it wasn't so much of a question mark in the eyes of some of the people who are close to the president and in the campaign. That has certainly changed now as you're seeing some of the numbers come in. Uh, and so I think that is a state, as we look at Georgia here, that, that's a big question mark, too, moving forward into the night. Yeah, we expect another uh, group of uh, Arizona numbers coming, I think, around 10.30 or so Eastern time. So we'll, uh, we'll continue to track the story. We'll take a quick break here. We'll continue our special Decision 2020 coverage in just a moment.
watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. out west 7:30 in arizona the center of the political universe at this moment because we are awaiting and receiving new batches of votes and the last batch that just came in was favorable to donald trump and narrowed that difference in votes narrowing joe biden's lead and we've been discussing as we uh, put up the, the road to 270 map chuck how important arizona is in this moment with the map as it stands we await arizona and we await Nevada, key to uh, Biden's prospects in this moment as Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia are unknown. Well, look, I mean, as, as we'll show you, I mean, there's, you know, we should, Joe Biden has all these simpler paths. And right now, if, he, if you just take, if you just do with the states he's leading, and those two right now, um, he's there. Oh, I need to take away Pennsylvania. I forgot that was still sitting there. And he gets right to 270. And again, as much as things look good for the Biden campaign in Pennsylvania, do they want to be in a, a lawsuit palooza uh, for the next six weeks and spend the holidays doing that? <laughs> or do they want to find a calmer path to do that, possibly a, a win in Arizona that's outside the recount error in Nevada, outside the recount error? But look, if somehow these split, right? If, you know, just one of them ends up, let's, you know, do that. Then, then you're going to be looking at either they've got to fight for Pennsylvania if you're, if you're Biden or you fight for Georgia or you wait a week and see if there's something to fight for in North Carolina. We don't know how many ballots, but just a reminder, I mean, we're not going to know till next week whether North Carolina becomes a situation that we're watching, for instance, in both Georgia and, and Arizona where vote comes in, margins shrink, you know. They're not, you're not going to see any change in that margin until possibly November 12th. In Pennsylvania and Georgia, votes are still trickling in, so we're still seeing that. Arizona is, as we speak, releasing more votes, so we're keeping our eye on that. Jeff Bennett is in Wilmington. He's covering the Biden campaign. I'm sure they're watching along with us. Did uh, their yeah. hearts sink a little bit when they saw this next batch of Arizona votes come in with a pretty favorable rate of a success for the president mm -hmm. in that batch, tightening the lead? And yet there is still a sense of confidence. There's still a sense of cautious optimism within the Biden campaign, I think, is best reflected by the candidate himself today who delivered that speech here in Delaware and walked right up to the line of declaring victory, never crossing it, uh, but saying, he said, that once all the votes are counted, he expects to prevail. And so right now, the campaign, I'm told, feels good about their standing in Arizona. They feel good about the remaining vote out in Nevada. They also feel uh, really encouraged and heartened by Joe Biden's performance performance in the Rust Belt. Because remember, his core pitch when he launched his campaign was that he was the guy, the son of Scranton, regular Joe who takes the Amtrak train to work every day, who could speak the language of blue collar workers and build back that blue wall. And he's done it in Michigan. He appears to be doing it, at least in Wisconsin. And I'm told the campaign feels good about their position in Pennsylvania. And so today, that was one of the reasons why Joe Biden really telegraphed the kind of president he wants to be. And that speech he delivered today and his speech was really a bookend to the speech he delivered when he launched his campaign, when all of the other Democratic candidates during the primary were positioning themselves as the fighter for progressive policies. He was the guy who was saying, I'm going to be the one who's going to bring about this return to normalcy. And even here today, he was talking about uniting the country, stepping into the cauldron of chaos and trying to bridge the gaps. And so right now, the campaign feels as if they're knocking on that door to 270. Of course, we have to wait for all the vote to come in to see if that'll actually happen. All right, Jeff, thank you. We want to uh, go to Blaine Alexander now in Atlanta, where the vote is still tricking, uh, trickling in a little bit uh, in, in Georgia, but it is awfully close. Uh, what have you learned, Blaine? 
You know, I've got to say, Lester, there is truly a sense of urgency right here in this room. This is Fulton County. This is where they are, quite frankly, scrambling to get these absentee ballots counted, sorted, and processed through. Just a few minutes ago, I spoke with the elections board chair for this county, and I asked him realistically, how late are they going to stay? He says it could go until about 3 a.m., possibly even later. And I asked him, are you determined? Are you certain that you're going to get this done tonight? And he told me absolutely. So that just kind of underscores the mood here, certainly in Fulton County. But if you wonder why we talk about this as almost kind of a patchwork, almost solution here in the state of Georgia, that's because it is. It really goes county by county. So while Fulton County is saying they're going to be finished tonight, another neighboring county, Gwinnett County, according to their latest update, it does not look like they'll be done with their tally this evening or done with their entire process. So, and there are certainly more across the country, across the state rather. So let's look at the latest numbers from Georgia's Secretary of State. As he's put it, there are about 107,000 ballots still outstanding, still looking to be processed. And as you guys said, that is certainly major because as we know, there are only right now about 39,000 votes that are separating President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden here in the state of Georgia. And of course, I don't need to underscore for you how major a Democratic win would be in the historically red state of Georgia. So when we talk about timing, it certainly is a bit of a moving target. The Secretary of State has said he's now eyeing sometime tomorrow morning. He's hopeful for tonight, but again, we still have a number of counties that are working to get their things done on their end. So we're again looking to sometime tomorrow morning, possibly, before we get the tally here in Georgia. Guys. Okay. Lane, thanks very much. I was just watching. The Georgia votes coming in so slowly. It, it, it literally was a thousand votes and then no, no update for like 20 minutes. I mean, that's all, but we did got like an additional thousand votes and you're like, really, is this how slow it's gonna come in? For well, but remember we were thanking but though that, I know. The, that this- No, 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 it's not work. about that, but it was like, <laughs> this is how slow this vote is coming. That's all I, I want, Georgia, I, I'll make, I, I, Georgia may not be called this week. Okay. I'm pretty confident coming that, that slow. I, it's also that close. It's also that close. It's yeah. just, it's on be close. absolute razor's edge. It is possible that this is one of those you have to wait to all the provisional ballots, all the this and then that. I mean, it is, uh, I think if all the provisional ballots are cured, you know, this is. Coin and coin yet coin. it may be one of the most fascinating, fascinating states of this process. Oh, especially it, I mean, since we got to go right back into the, no matter what. Georgia's not getting anything. We're all going to learn a lot We're gonna about learn a lot more. politics here. It's just a slow-mo now. It feels you know. a little... Ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, I Trust just... me, I'm no longer going to say DeKalb County, right? I know it's DeKalb now. <laughs> and we're all going to learn how to make sure we, we pronounce these counties even better in two you, months. You're talking about because two Senate, Senate races yep. are going to run off in Georgia. The, yeah. the, that election will be in early January. Yeah, and right. may ultimately decide whether the Republicans or the Democrats control the Senate, depending on how the numbers it's, shake it's out. An, it's likely the majority is going to be on the line in those two races which means potentially potentially over a hundred million dollars could be spent there in in a couple of months but I mean the reality right now I think as we're looking in Georgia from a, a source reporting perspective you know I still have people who are saying okay Arizona we feel this way about this ballot dump Pennsylvania we feel good broadly Georgia everyone is saying we have no idea because it's going to go back and forth on these little tiny groups uh, of ballots uh, and you're right Lester I mean we we, I started hearing about Georgia probably a week before Election Day. People started saying, hey, there's something going on there. You should yeah. watch that. Uh, but before that, I don't think it was really on our maps in, in a serious hey, way as this. Uh, control Room, put up the David Perdue Ossoff race again, because Casey and I was, were discussing something uh, about a half hour ago. We talk about all these recounts. Well, uh, the, the recount provision is if you're at 50 per, below 50%, it goes to a recount, right? Oh. So, you do see recounts, and this happens all the time in runoff states and primaries, yeah. where you want to see a recount to see if you made it into the recount or if you were able to avoid. If you were at like 49.5 and you want to avoid a recount, you want to see, are there any additional you mean you votes? you want to avoid a, re the, runoff. a runoff. A runoff. You want to avoid the runoff. So, David, so it'll be fascinating here. No matter what happens when, the, when all the votes are counted here, we're going to be sitting, is Purdue at 50.01? Well, then Ossoff's going to probably ask for a recount to see if he can find votes to put Purdue down. If, if Purdue's at 49.8, then Purdue may say, no, 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 no. I want a recount to see if I can get to 50 and avoid the runoff. What I'm saying is the likelihood we're going to get a recount in Georgia is probably going to be Senate race focused first, and it's going to be that Senate race to determine whether or not a there's runoff a is going to happen. Uh, and the, if there's a recount at the presidential level. I, you know, I should amend also what I just said on, on terms of the Senate majority, because if you do see David Perdue hang on to that 
50 percent plus where he that wouldn't means, have to have the runoff. Right. Purdue would win outright. He'd go back to the Senate. He's a Republican. Then unless something really crazy happens in Alaska or someplace that we, we don't uh, know about yet, it's likely the majority wouldn't be at stake because with Susan Collins hanging on in Maine, Democrats would really need to win both of these seats, if my math is correct. And forgive me, I've been trying not to do math for a lot of hours in a row now. Uh, but they would need to win both of these at once to really um, to take the majority, we think. So if this one is off the map uh, if off, or off the table, uh, then there's only one Senate race. That means that the majority is not on the line. But Democrats still would have a lot invested because they've got a candidate there. Chuck knows Raphael, uh, Reverend Warnock. Warnock is his name. Um, he's the preacher at the, the church where Martin Luther King Jr. used to preach. He's potentially a first, you know, it's very significant test of of all of the machinery Stacey Abrams has been building down in Georgia. And if he were to win that race, I think he'd be a serious national player. Let's uh, let's take a look now at Nevada, where they've essentially knocked off of the Knights. There's no numbers coming out of there right now. Uh, Jolene Kent in Las Vegas, who can shed a little more light on, on what their plan is to give us some more vote. Yeah, Lester, you're absolutely right. No more results coming out of Nevada tonight. We'll get a new batch of numbers come tomorrow morning. But here's what we know so far. A lot of votes have already been counted, and Biden does maintain a very slight lead. So as for the votes that have been counted, which ones are they? We know it's all in-person early votes, all in-person Election Day votes, and then most of the mail ballots that were received before Election Day. So that means here in Clark County, we just talked to you earlier today, the registrar here, Joe Gloria, and he told me they're continuing to to count. They'll resume tomorrow morning. They can process 70,000 a day. And what the focus is going to be on, according to the Nevada Secretary of State, is going to be the mail ballots received on or after Election Day and ballots cast by voters who do that same day voter registration. So if you think about it, they say they can hear in Clark County process 70,000 ballots a day. So do the math. They're not telling us how many votes they have outstanding to count because it's very hard to know that number here in Nevada because voters who are registered automatically receive a ballot in the mail. So you may or may not be returning that ballot, right? So they're still trying to figure out how many that they need to count, but they're in process doing it relatively smoothly. But you guys were talking about a recount earlier. And what's interesting here in Nevada is you'll remember that Hillary Clinton came away with Nevada just narrowly back in 2016. And so the Trump campaign certainly watching this very closely. Their lawyers are certainly watching it very closely. So anyone can call for a recount here in Nevada. You can be a candidate, a campaign, an individual. And if that is called for in the state of Nevada, the Secretary of State, the government has just 10 days to figure it out. But you know what? The, the timeline, the horizon here in Nevada could be a little wild because you have until December 10th to get your vote here as long as it's postmarked on or before election day, right? And then they have two days to cure those signatures. If there's any sort of signature matching issues. And then they have until November 16th. That is the final deadline where they must canvas and before then or by that day, put up the official results. So uh, we should have a new batch of numbers come tomorrow. But uh, Reno, uh, Washoe County there, and then here in Clark County, we're expecting more numbers. We were hoping to get some earlier today that didn't materialize for Reno. So we're hoping to get them tomorrow, 9 or 10 a.m. The 9 a.m. timestamp is when, here in Clark County, they're going to resume the ballot counting. They're going to go back into those mail-in ballots, those provisionals, and get this process going again uh, for day two after the election. And that, that's 9 right? Pacific time. That's right, local okay. time. Local Indeed. time. All right, Joe Lane Kent, thank you. <laughs> You're just calculating how well, long I'm am just, I going to get to sleep? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm just thinking. So, okay, <laughs> there so will be no sleep for any of us. It's afternoon here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's go to NBC News contributors Maria Teresa Kumar. She's the president and CEO of Voto Latino, and Hugh Hewitt, host of the Hugh Hewitt Show on the Salem Radio Network and a supporter of President Trump. Hugh, you got your ear to the ground or on your cell phone. Got a little good news in Arizona today for the president. Nevada still hanging out there, a narrow margin. Um, but in Pennsylvania, the word on the street seems to be from both Democrats and Republicans that it's looking like a tougher climb for the president. What are you hearing? 
Well, let me start, Micro uh, Savannah. There are 346 votes left in Maricopa County. I just got a text from the Republican war room there. We have great confidence in Governor Ducey and Attorney General Brnovich there. Uh, Adam Laxalt, the former Attorney General of Nevada, is leading the recount there. But Arizona is actually the closest state to tipping into the Trump column. Uh, the least close state to tipping into the Trump column is Nevada. Pennsylvania, unlike what Senator McCaskill said yesterday, my Pennsylvania sources are very competent, but they realize that an attorney general, Josh Shapiro, who's a Democrat, they've got a very, very good team of Democrats on that side. The context, though, which I think I want to make sure everyone hears, this isn't about Donald Trump. The Republican Party has to fight. They have to fight in Arizona. They have to fight in Nevada. They have to fight in Georgia, where they have to charge up for, as you've noted, two runoff races, which they're very confident about, which would leave the Senate 52-48. So they have to show their supporters, not just their contributors, but their voters, that they are not a party that gets walked over. They have to be at least as aggressive as Joe Biden would be, where he reversed with the president right now. They have to be at least as aggressive as Al Gore was. And in fact, they've learned from the 2000 experience, Al Gore tried to cherry pick uh, recounting, and he lost. Uh, he should have recounted the entire state. Instead, I think it was six counties he tried to recount. So they are going to fight on the beaches. They are going to fight on the mountains. They're going to fight everywhere. And it's not because of Donald Trump. It's because they feel that leading up to the election, uh, every single poll was biased against them. I'm so glad NBC did not make any improvident calls last night because they're mad at other networks that called too early or called too late. Uh, they're just generally in a combative mood, and it's not the president. You go down to the precinct holders. We, we had a great night in the House. We had a very good night in the Senate. Had a good night with picking up one governor and the state legislators, and they just want to be combative. And it begins in Maricopa County. Maria, give us, Maria. Your, give us your survey of the landscape right now as we, we sit here and we're watching Arizona. We won't get more numbers in Nevada till tomorrow. You've got uh, Georgia by a thread. Uh, where are we? Well, you know, it's interesting because I was talking to the campaign, and of course, everyone is everyone's saying that they're winning. But let's be very clear. In Arizona, 25 percent of the early vote was the youth vote. That's the, what's getting counted right now in the Latino—and there's 25 percent Latino youth vote. What is happening in Arizona is very similar to the demographic shifts that we are also seeing in Georgia. In Georgia, you saw 75 percent of the people that were voting for, uh, that were Latino, that were, uh, were voting for Joe Biden. But then you also have not just the Latino demographic aging in, you have young professionals coming in with new industry. The tech industry in Arizona is parallel to the Hollywood tech industry that you're seeing in Georgia. So it's going to be super close. But the story is that it is, it is the young Latino vote heading the heading that charge along with a lot of new white voters that are coming in that just simply weren't there in 2016. Now in Nevada, Nevada is going to be something that is very close, but again, it's the young Latino vote that is leading the charge. That is not the case for all Latino voters, but in those particular states, in Georgia, in Arizona, in Nevada, it is the young Latino voter that has been aging in. At Voto Latino, we have registered 67,000 in Arizona, 35,000 respectively in Nevada and in Georgia, and they have been responding. So I think it's still up for grabs, but I do think that just based on the demographic aging in, what we know what happened in Colorado, what we know what happened in uh, in Virginia a couple cycles back, that is the that is the road that we see for Nevada, Arizona, and possibly Georgia. I, I got to ask you, Maria, when this is all said and done, though, uh, are you, you going to be looking hard at the president did well with Latinos, relatively speaking, improved on his numbers from 2016, and also with the black community as well. So it was an uneven performance um, for Joe Biden in terms of the Latino vote across the country. I think that what we saw specifically in the Latino vote in Florida was that, unlike the states that I just mentioned, they did not have show me your paper laws. They did not have anti-immigrant laws. So the Latino person there was able to see and talk very much about why they fled their native lands, whether it was communism in Cuba, Venezuela, which was socialism, or even in Colombia, failed democracy. So that socialism message really stuck because they're not being pigeonholed, sadly, as show me your papers. Whereas in Virginia, excuse me, uh, yeah, well, Virginia was one of them, one of the reasons why it switched. But in Georgia, in Arizona, 
in Nevada, you see these show me your paper laws. In Texas, I mean, we're not talking about it tonight, but in Texas, you saw a 600% increase in the Latino youth vote because of the strenuous circumstances. And so, yes, the Latino vote is absolutely not monolithic. But when you start peeling apart, especially intergenerationally, where the opportunity is for the Democrats, it's the young voter. They're almost half of the eligible voters, and it's young Latinas, excuse me, and it's female. It's the men that they are going to have to figure out, how do you talk to the men in the Latino community? They don't necessarily outperform their their white gendered on the other side. I'm terribly put, guys. But you know <laughs> We're all cruising on 20 minutes sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I think that the that the the campaign the Democrats are going to have to have a real conversation and Latino males in a way that is authentic, that is meeting them where they are, and that can back a lot of the disinformation that we know actually is out there uh, online. All right, Maria Truce, Teresa Kumar, and Hugh Hewitt, thank you for coming on. Another quick break here. We'll be back with more as Decision 2020 continues on NBC. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The winds fanning these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning, welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think, we're excited? Or back to work, we're keeping you safe. I love being back. <laughs> Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. And welcome back to NBC News election headquarters. We continue to watch numbers trickle in from these battleground states as we continue to try to figure out who will be the president for the next four years. Chuck Todd is back at the map. Do you want to give us a quick uh, look at where Pennsylvania stands? Well, uh, yeah, you know, we got to. We, we saw uh, Donald Trump's margin dropped by 5,000 uh, with a just a small, I mean, literally. You know, I, I, uh, just a tiny bit uh, of vote came in uh, a little bit here, a decent amount, but it did allow Biden to cut that lead. Um, let me do my favorite little check in here uh, as we do. And guess what? Still no additional vote in Philadelphia. I continue to remind you, um, if this is what's really got to scare the Trump campaign, we don't have any of that Philly vote yet. And the margin could get where Philly will deliver it by itself. Uh, the way things are going. But one of the things, you know, we have not been able to focus a lot on the House because of what's happened right now. But this was a really good night, uh, a surprisingly good night for Republicans. And one of the points we want to make is how, uh, I think, important, how, big of an, how big of a night it was for Donald Trump even in losing. Because Donald Trump being on the ballot 
basically uh, cost a whole bunch of freshman Democrats who won in 18 when Donald Trump was on the ballot. They picked up some Trump, some Trump districts, uh, and they lost them this time. There's South Carolina won. This was... Uh, this one really surprised This one surprised a whole bunch of people. It was really close. Cunningham was seen in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina was seen as sort of just like we were seeing in the Atlanta suburbs. Charleston was sort of the beginning of South Carolina becoming maybe a, 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 a reddish tint towards purple. It's a lot of well, country club Republicans, a lot of transplants that, from New York. Exactly. Charleston has, and so, and yet it didn't hold. That doesn't mean this isn't going to remain a swing area. And I think this is more, I think, the power of Donald Trump. Because when you see the pattern here, and let me stay in, in the southern region here, this is Oklahoma City. This was a surprise in 2018 when Kendra Horn, who ran a terrific campaign in 2018. She did. Um, very, uh, very much a centrist Democrat, conservative Democrat, sort of in the older tradition of Oklahoma Democrats who have succeeded. Um, but she was thought of as somebody that was going to have a tough time surviving. And it's just the power of Trump on the ballot. Um, uh, Kendra Horn lose. Let me take it in New Mexico, too. New Mexico, too, this is the, oh, the most conservative area, the biggest district, which means it's the most rural, uh, if you will. And, and this was, you know, this was this one. This a real disappointment for Democrats. They thought they were, because they got, they got, a, they thought the weaker Republican nominee uh, during yeah. the primary, and yet uh, it wasn't enough. Again, a district that Trump carried. Um, one of our, the, so far, the only non-freshmen to lose, and we know there are others that could end up losing, Colin Peterson, who's been in Congress since 1990, chairman of the time. Agriculture Committee, and frankly, he's been living on borrowed political time. You know, he was basically, he's the one of two Democrats, in fact, ended up being the only Democrat, uh, because the other guy changed parties, who voted against impeachment. Uh, as a way, it didn't work. He got throttled here, as you can see, because, again, strong Trump district. And then, finally, uh, Iowa won. This is the, 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 this one here, Iowa won, Abby Finkenauer. This is one where, to me, if she survived, Biden was going to carry Iowa. The only way she was going to survive, she needed Biden to carry Iowa, because this is how Democrats win Iowa, by doing well in the first and the second district. Obviously, that didn't happen. Very talented candidate on the Republican side, though, there, though very well known. But, you know, Chuck, big picture, I don't, I don't know if we're able to put up the, the map of all of the sure. the house races just to kind of take a look yeah, at it fun. because I think it I think it shows you and, and and this is part of what I've been relying on in terms of how we talk about the presidential race and and how divided the country is because we're, we still don't know it's it's possible Biden could win with 270 electoral college votes possibly could lose entirely it's possible he could win with a whole bunch but this really shows you kind of how the cultural divide is playing out in this country. And the fact that, you know, Democrats went into this election night thinking that they were going to win at a minimum five to seven additional House seats. So they thought there was going to be more blue on this map than I'll what we I'll tell you where they saw. thought they were going to get some blue. It was right in the there. state of Texas. Yeah, in Texas. There was a whole bunch of uh, some blue they thought they would add over here, some blue, and then, of course, this district, which we haven't called yet, but but yeah. this is at the border. It's a district that the Democrats always think they should have. They struggle with it at times. Yeah. Um, and there were districts in Michigan, too. They thought they would hold on to uh, Michigan as well. I don't mean Michigan second district. And then North Carolina, there's some seats where they're disappointed. This this just goes to show they, they were incredibly, frankly, overconfident about it. And they, they were saying we could win as many as, as 12 to 14 seats on a good night. It just showed you how they were thinking about Donald Trump and what they sort of viewed as the absurdity of the idea that he would win re-election or that they In fairness, would Republicans stand. thought they were going to lose big as yeah. That's true. That's absolutely so it's true. It's kind of interesting that um, the weekend before, the weekend before, I had a Republican yeah. from the big super PAC say, "Oh man, we just want to be on, uh, you know, uh, above 190 in the House." Yeah, no, for sure. And, and I'm not trying to just criticize Democrats and, and their numbers here, but I, I, but I do think that it it shows you that the depth to which Donald Trump uh, has really, whether it's that he's stoked the culture wars or that people feel like they're participants in that. You know, you look at those House numbers, and that that can really help you understand. Yeah. All of this. We're going to fit in a break here and we'll be back with more Decision 2020 coverage right after this.
watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. In 2020, we continue to watch those uh, six states right now outstanding that uh, could determine who the next president will be. That's what Arizona is showing right now. It is too early to call. We've been looking at a Biden lead there, but we've got some new numbers uh, recently and, and Donald Trump uh, adding. Uh, to his total. So we'll continue to watch more numbers expected to come in there a bit later on this evening. Uh, also right now, Pennsylvania, that's the other big prize everyone is uh, watching. Too early to call in Pennsylvania. Uh, Trump out, out in front there, but Biden has been slowly but steadily closing that lead. Yeah, and we're waiting for more votes to come in and be counted there. Uh, in Georgia, it is a nail biter. Too close to call. We are being told by our correspondent on the ground they're going to be counting late into the night there. This one is a squeaker. North Carolina, press pause on this one. It's too close to call, and we don't anticipate any more counting uh, to be released until as far out as next week. I, I, which still feels like a weird thing to say. November, really, guys? We're going to wait till November 12th? Well, we think. Well, Nevada, they'll <laughs> yeah. be back at it tomorrow. Yes. Uh, so let's look at Nevada. <laughs> that is uh, too close to call, but they have knocked off for the evening, as we mentioned, but they uh, plan to get back at it 9 o'clock Pacific time tomorrow. Uh, Alaska, it is too early to call there, but you can see Donald Trump uh, with a significant lead right now as we look at 56% of the expected vote in. All right, so there's the White House, and we can fire up the 270 map, the road to 270. It's filled out quite a bit, but the, the suspense still with us. Chuck, you're over at your what if map. So, what are the different scenarios now? Well, number one, I just want to remind people if we just give, we know who's leading in every state. So, let's just do that. All right. Alaska, Trump leads. Nevada, Arizona, Biden leads right now. Pennsylvania, Trump leads. North Carolina, Trump leads. Georgia, Trump leads. So if we just did that, there would be your final, your, your final result, 270, 268. 2000 election was 271, 267. So uh, I don't, we have never had it uh, that close. That's just assuming that. Uh, at this point, and it is a reminder of the different paths. I mean, this is a the fastest path, well, the fastest path now uh, for Joe Biden to get to 270. Actually, it's just simply Pennsylvania at this point, if you, if you, if you check fastest, it out carefully. Fastest, but not the, not but the not, neatest. Not but the, the easiest. But it's the one with the most pain, <laughs> exactly. Where uh, Nevada and Arizona, where you don't need it, a lot less pain uh, on that front. So, look, it, it's... In that sense, I think, let's see how the night goes with Arizona, and I think it then dictates. I mean, if Arizona is suddenly a jump ball, um, then the Biden campaign is going to be, I think, basically t becomes a three-state strategy because they're going to want to make sure that one of Arizona, Pennsylvania, or Georgia comes through because they only need... They're in this position. They only need one of those to come through, uh, assuming they keep Nevada. It, it always strikes me when you think about these campaigns that have invested so much time and focus, and they control their own destinies, and you get to this point now, you're a day after the election, and there's not a thing you can do. We, we at least have this. We, we can do this and play with the boards and have this academic and journalism exercise, but they can't do anything to can't move buy another here. ad. Yeah. Let's put an ad. We can target that. Oh. No, yeah. no. Yeah. The voted, votes right? have all been cast. That's done. Now it's just the counting. Uh, and in some places, that's taken longer than anyone would like. Kelly O'Donnell's with us. She's at the White House. I should mention, we are awaiting more vote from Arizona tonight. We expect a little bit more, so we'll keep our eye on that. Kelly, what are you hearing from Trump world tonight? Well, one of the things that really stands out, Savannah, is the unusual silence 
from a president who is known for being blunt, brash, always using his own megaphone of social media. We're not seeing that from the president and not as much from his allies either. Now, I've been talking with sources in Arizona, and they, of course, are looking at your home state with great interest. And part of what we've also been looking at is how do these states, especially with a Republican governor and Doug Ducey in the case of Arizona, how can that partnership and relationship uh, help the Trump campaign understand their numbers? Uh, before we all got to nights like this and the country's learning about the counties and so forth, the campaigns have their own personal histories with knowing where do their voters reside, who do they work and spend the most money to draw out, and then you layer in a Republican governor like Doug Ducey, who has his own electoral history in his state. And then you bring in the Cindy McCain factor. She, of course, came out in support of Joe Biden, but retaining her Republican credentials, not getting involved in other races, speaking to Republicans in places like Scottsdale, Maricopa County, truly red places where she has a long personal history with her late husband, of course, Senator John McCain. And if this ultimately becomes a Biden story in Arizona, that relationship of Cindy McCain may tell part of the story, especially with suburban women. But the Trump campaign is still arguing that their math is what they know best and their data is what they know best. And that as some of these results come in, Maricopa County, they're outperforming, they say. Then you'll have a county like Pima County in Arizona, which could give Biden some more help. Close, close, close. Arizona is one of those states where the president spent a lot of time in 2016, not as much time in 2020. And you have to think that in the silence of these hours of waiting, if there isn't some thinking about places where they might have used the candidates' time, resources, and so forth, Arizona's history and the president's uh, own personal combative history uh, with the McCain legacy in Arizona may be part of the story as well. So that's something they're watching. And again, looking uh, from Trump world perspective at Pennsylvania, they still see a path there. And of course, they're counting on Georgia and North Carolina going their way. Uh, the pathways are fewer than for Joe Biden. And what is, again, striking is they are not filling the void uh, in talking about where they see things going. Now, maybe we can just chalk it up to everybody's tired and the weight is what it is. Uh, but it is notable that from a Trump White House, we don't have a new tweet to tell you about or a new comment from the president. Savannah? That All right. In itself is a headline. Uh, let's bring in Jeff Bennett covering the Biden campaign in Wilmington, Delaware. They put their guy out earlier today who made a very strong statement that he believes that uh, he will win all this. Uh, what are you hearing right now? That's right. And look, I'll, I'll take the baton from my good friend and co colleague uh, Kelly Owen talking about Pennsylvania, because as we wait for the numbers to come in, all we can really do is, is read the tea leaves right now in that state. And, and uh, one Biden campaign staffer is taking heart in what's happening in Pennsylvania's 17th district, particularly with uh, Congressman Connor Lamb. He's a 36 year old Marine Corps veteran who was sort of swept into office with all of the progressive energy in the 2018 midterms, um, sort of as a rebuke to President Trump's election and 2016. And right now, uh, he appears to be in the lead. And so they are sort of uh, extrapolating from that what, the, what Pennsylvania could portend uh, for Joe Biden. And what's so interesting about that is that Connor Lamb campaigned uh, with Joe Biden back in Iowa and talked a lot about the fact that, as he saw it, uh, Joe Biden could help down ballot candidates uh, like himself. So right now, the campaign is still expressing confidence and cautious optimism about how their candidate is faring. And, and one one of the ways we know that is because today the campaign launched a transition website. It established its transition team some months ago, but today they launched a splash page uh, for what they hope will be to come if Joe Biden, of course, is victorious. I, I wonder if this is taking a little bit of a page out of book, not, not a, a, a perfect comparison, but you go back to the 2000 recount and remember the Bush folks immediately took the stature and, right. own, and, and owned the idea that this was the, this was the president-elect. They started the transition process. Lester, it is all about, you know, who, that, that is they're sort of recount politics, right? That sort of thing. I think it, the, the person that establishes them said, well, we're ahead. And right now, Joe Biden, macro is ahead. Right? And he's got and a transition website. That's right. As he, well. He, he's ahead, and so that does put added pressure on, on those trying to change it, on Donald Trump. So it, it makes it does well, just perception. I'm like Bush v. Gore, the president's actually in the White House, so it's a little different. That a does. Little different. But, but it's a little can, different. But if right. he gets the call, let's, let's say, you know, uh, you know Biden gets, it gets the call here soon. 
given what's going on with on the legal challenges, uh, you would think that the, the Biden folks are going to quickly take that, not only accept, but take that sense of ownership and, and be seen in that role. That's an interesting question we should ask. Uh, let's ask an expert. Robert Gibbs is with us. He's the former press secretary to President Obama and was a senior advisor on his campaigns. And uh, Robert, what, what's your view? If you were advising the Biden campaign tonight, uh, what posture would you recommend they take? Well, look, I thought they did a great job today getting out there and establishing exactly what you all have talked about, which is establishing themselves as owning this process. And quite frankly, much like uh, last night, I assumed once Biden went out, we'd see and hear from Donald Trump, not just on a tweet, but in person. And I think what Kelly is saying, not coming out, I think, does give you a little bit of a tell of where the Trump campaign and the president believe this race seems to be headed. So, so what happens now in, in the coming days? Uh, if, this, if this thing drags out, what's the effect on the, the, whoever the president-elect is going to be and, and the electorate in general? If, if, we're, if we're sitting here, what's today? Today's Thursday? What? Wednesday. Today's, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're all like that, Leonard. Me too. Yeah, but <laughs> but if, we're, if we're working our days off this weekend, what's, what's, the, what's the effect? Well, look, I, I think that they continue to be out there. I think the Biden campaign wants to continue to be out there messaging to their supporters. I think that moving forward in that transition, command of government, looking like you're a leader, speaking like you're a president, those are the things that you want to command. Again, surprised a bit today that Trump was off the stage a bit and let Joe Biden do that. I mean, Trump is a master showman. He is the chief marketing officer. And to to have left that stage open today, again, I think probably surprised a lot of people. Are you, are you surprised they have, uh, Biden has not been, or even the president, not been seen out being presidential, uh, aside from just speeches, but just uh, making appearances being seen? Well, I think you could certainly see something like that. You could also see, I, I could see, and I probably would plan if I was them, a briefing of sorts, get an economic briefing, right? Get an intelligence briefing, meet with advisors uh, on the coronavirus as we've seen uh, the number of cases skyrocket. I think anytime you look like you're in command and look like you're the president elect in, in the case of Biden, uh, I think that is always going to be a plus in the minds. Uh, of people that are watching this process close. Hey, you want to weigh in on uh, Arizona? Which, uh, it's 10-11 here in the east. We may get some more numbers here in the next uh, next few minutes, but we did see uh, Donald Trump pick up, uh, was it 13,000? He's busy. I think it was 13,000 additional. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm doing some Georgia calculations, doing too. Georgia? Oh, yeah, but we'll, we'll go to Arizona. <laughs> sorry. I, I had some Georgia math here. Robert, Looks. Chuck's being Chuck. He's doing sorry. math over here <laughs> in the back of the envelope, I, literally. Yeah. He's the only one I'm literally in back of the envelope <laughs> yeah. right now, yes. Anyway, so, no, with Arizona. You know that phone doubles as a calculator. We, we know what the math he's doing. But well, no, Robert, but look yeah, at a place like, about Arizona? But look at a place... Well, I, I think in a place like Arizona, look, I, I think the Biden campaign is still confident. I think... Not only do you have uh, some of that vote still out in Maricopa, but you've got uh, Pima County, which is even bluer than Maricopa County. So I think watching that on the end, and I think where Chuck is about to go is we've seen this vote, you know, kind of dribble in over the course of the night. When, you know, when we started this hour, it was 39,000, little, almost 40,000 in Georgia. Now we're down to 33,000. I, I think this thing is getting closer and closer. I think most of the campaigns think Georgia is a real jump ball. And that, again, gives you a whole other scenario for the Biden campaign to get to 270. And that's your introduction to... There it is. Thank you, Robert. Right. <laughs> I appreciate that, Gibbs, because we are sitting... There's your difference, 33,300. So now what math were you doing? Just Well, the Secretary of State told us that there's 98,000 ballots that are remaining. We do know that most of the, we, we, we're pretty confident most of these ballots are essentially in and around Atlanta. So the Cab County here, this is an 8315 county, right? Uh, for Biden, Fulton County was a 7226. I, I just point those numbers out for a reason here. 98,000 votes is what's left to be counted. If these are all where we think they are and in these Atlanta counties, and Joe Biden wins just 70% of that vote, he will net 38,000 votes from what's remaining. And, you know, 38 minus 30, you, you could see what would happen there. It would flip the lead. Wild. My point is, I, we'll see if it's that. 
We'll see if it's all coming from there. It's possible. There's a red county here or there. I that was going to say, how do we know where it's outstanding? We, we, don't, we know most of them that are outstanding are here. I mean, uh, you know, we, we've, got our little, we've got our little thing here. We know there's approximately 9,000 there. Let's go to mm -hmm. Fulton County. Uh, approximately 31,000 there. You know, you could start to put it up, and you see that. It, it, let's see, uh, Gwinnett County, there's 14. It won't be quite. See, that could be a, a less of a split. But the point is... Uh, I just went to Do you Fulton. Have Cobb County. Yeah, up here's there? Cobb. There's another 15 there. I'm obsessed there. with Cobb County. Well, I, I, I'm with you because Cobb is I a like great Cobb story. I like Cobb salad, but that's <laughs> <what> I like <laughs> Cobb salad too. So, but, but just so, so, yeah, this is the home of Newt Gingrich. Right. So, so this is the the quintessential kind of place where when Republicans talk about being worried about the suburbs, they are worried about places like Cobb County. It's an upscale suburb uh, of Georgia, historically a Republican stronghold, as, as, as Chuck has pointed out, and it has been moving. And you saw it there in 2016 move uh, just a little bit. Uh, there's also a lot of interesting uh, stuff going on at the congressional level here. Uh, but, but this is a bellwether for Republicans across the map and also representative of this cultural split that we have been talking about. This is an area uh, where you see a little bit more of that. You know, they're college educated, many uh, white voters here. And this is the kind of place that could decide, especially if these Senate races go to a runoff, this is the kind of place we're going to be looking at to see if uh, Democrats actually Actually, have a chance to hold on in, in a more traditional type of. This was Newt Gingrich's home Newt Gingrich's district. Home this district. is the birthplace of the Republican the birthplace, Revolution in the 90s. Yes, this is where it was. It is now. And what's interesting, the question, and uh, the question I have is. Is Georgia now permanently, is Georgia going to join Florida as just one of these places now? This is your Denver and your Phoenix Correct. example. Correct. Is yeah. it going to be Florida where Georgia will stay in the battleground? Or is it going to be Virginia and Colorado when the Northern Virginia suburbs and the Denver suburbs started to move and it was just sort of like, yeah, we're here purple. And then it was just like they walked right literally from red to blue. You just saw that in Cobb. I mean, this is in a decade you go. I mean, this is just remarkable. In a decade, you go from 10 points, shoot, in eight years, you go from essentially a plus 10 Republican district, a reliable, lean Republican. You're not going to sit here and say this is rock solid, but a reliable, lean Republican to literally you flipped at 20 points. Mm. So uh, the question I have is, is Georgia staying purple or is it basically um, purple as it moves to blue and in two cycles it becomes more reliably blue a la Virginia, which it'll take a special type of Republican to win statewide in Virginia. You know what's right interesting when you're thinking about that? I was thinking about you're saying there's a, there are states that have marched from red to purple mm -hmm. to blue. There's also states that have marched from battleground states to reliably red, I think about Missouri. Yep. I wonder if Ohio's headed in that direction. Feels that way. It's now two cycles in a row at eight points. I'm not ready to do it for Iowa. Iowa narrowed a bit down to six. I, Iowa is sort of, you know, it, it has a it has a little Minnesota in it, and at the same time, it has a little bit of Ohio in it. So, it it's going to stay in the swing. But you're right. We've seen, and this is something I, I always like to remind you. Every state finds itself in and out of the battleground every generation. You know, you do, it's a, a generation will cycle in and out. A state that may come into the battleground in, say, a decade might be a place like Kansas. Um, and so this stuff is, you know, I think we're in the middle of a realignment right now. And as the suburbs continue to realign, as we continue to diversify as a country, this map could shake up even more. Well, that's the big picture stuff, but we're counting to 270 tonight. We got a presidential race. We still got to decide. Oh, yeah. We are waiting. Arizona's filing some votes tonight. Georgia's still doing it. Pennsylvania's still doing it. It's on. Still on. Still and on. we're still on. And we'll be back right after this. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app.
President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. (laughs) Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. right now on this race for president or on Chuck Todd as well. <laughs> See, whenever he walks away, it's well, going to we get were, good. We, we, we want to do a check-in here in Nevada. Um, uh, and uh, Sorry, I, I wanted to start statewide here. Um, remember this difference, and this is something we expect tomorrow morning, 8,000 vote difference. And we heard John Ralston say he believes these are a lot of mail-in ballots, that those went heavy. He's our for, Nevada expert, John He is John our Nevada, Nevada expert. He, he knows his stuff. But look... I think we all have to have some humility here. Um, these weren't blowouts for Biden. Clark, there's no doubt that Clark County is is how Democrats win uh, Nevada. But hey, you know, it's a seven point spread, uh, maybe closer to eight point spread. We shouldn't just assume that it comes in that way. We already saw in Maricopa, um, it's been coming in in Arizona. Uh, and look, uh, we don't know how much is going to come out. Uh, I, I think he said we're still going to get some. I watched, we think, 30,000 uh, 30, votes there. Look, this is 50-46. We can't assume all 30,000 are going to break Biden's way. This is something that could easily break a few points uh, the president's and way. And Nevada didn't tell us what was day of vote and what was early no, vote. No, it's so been really no frustrating. Tea there. This is one of those things where we needed Ralston to, like, you know. Back of the envelope for us <laughs> uh, uh, on this front, and then of course there's the there's the rest of the state. There's not a ton of population here, but uh, you'll start to see. Let me show you some of these. Where's mar- Elko? Oh, where did we go here? Let me show you some of these margins. I didn't mean to do that. All right, um, Elko, Nevada is one of I'm, my favorite uh, places on go. the presidential map. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to sit here and, and, and show you some of these other red counties, so you can see just how big these margins are for the president. There's not a lot of votes, but they're giant margins for him. So any of this stuff yeah. that trickles in here. I mean, these are 60s, 74. Um, you could see. I mean, this there is, it is. In the, Elko yeah, County. There, this is what you wanted. There's your <laughs> Every Republican flies to Elko County. There's one tiny little airport in Elko, <laughs> and they do it for this reason because the whole middle of the state's red. Uh, and it's just, you know, so any obviously any vote that comes from Clark or Washoe, the Biden people feel good. But, you know, there's going to be extraneous ballot that comes from these areas as well. Well, yeah, and it's a tight, it's 7,000 approximately that is the, yeah. the, the margin Nevada right is now. a smaller state, 7,000. That would be the equivalent of being sort of down, um, uh, being down, say, 20,000 in Wisconsin, for okay. what it's worth. Hey, yeah. Chuck, can we talk briefly? Um, it looks like Mark Kelly, I realize, I don't think we've called Arizona's Senate race yet. Uh, but Mark Kelly is, is declaring victory there as the, as, the, as the votes roll in. And, you know, I think they're pretty confident still that he's going to outperform Joe Biden in Arizona. I'm wondering, I mean, do you read anything into them deciding that, hey, they're ready? what happened when they just did that? When they did that well, dump. That, it, 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 it had a big... Um, it, it narrowed a little a, bit. Let a me big take batch of it. Pima County, which is Tucson, which is his wife, Gabby Giffords. Yes, of you know, course. Um, he used to represent that area, yes. of course. And, and so I wonder if he got a big bump out of being the But Let me just show you something. You'll, you'll see it fast here. So Biden, 50, 47. Biden's vote total, 1.44. Let me bring you the Kelly McSally race. As you can see, Kelly's uh, going to be the leading vote getter in the, in the state of Arizona yep. over Biden. That, that they is, knew that going in, too, um, I think. And so, and, you know, he's running about uh, almost two points better uh, in there. And this is, look, this has been the case where... Um, it's been interesting how many of the Senate candidates 
uh, have basically run with the president, right? You bet, you know, he's at 47.9. McSally runs just behind him at 47.7. The, the thing that clearly is benefiting Kelly, those libertarians um, yeah. that pick third party in the presidential, you know, if they couldn't pick between Trump and, and Biden, they seem to pick the astronaut. He's really tried to take up the McCain mantle, I think, um, and has, uh, you know, uh, as they've tried to figure out how to... Kirsten you know, Cinema wants that mantle, too, you know. She does, <laughs> yes. But Mark right. Kelly, I think, has, has really tried to... That's the other Democratic senator yeah. in, um, That's right. in Arizona. Let's, well, See, let's... I'm just sitting here translating. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Chuck and I can kind of go off the deep end on a lot of these, let's get, a lot of these folks. Let's get back to Nevada, <laughs> where our friend uh, Jacob Soboroff is in uh, Las Vegas right now. Uh, Jacob, what do you know? Lester, I don't want to uh, be the bearer of any bad news, and I wouldn't call this bad news, but I don't think we're going to be uh, getting results out of here, at least, from Clark County, Nevada. Definitely not tonight, but perhaps not for uh, another couple days. I know that the margin is only between seven and 8,000 votes, as you and Chuck and Casey and Savannah uh, were all just talking about, but they are being very slow and very deliberate about the counting of the ballots here uh, in Las Vegas and in Clark County. Those six electoral votes uh, that we're looking at on that map are going to come out, uh, in all likelihood, uh, of this facility, the Clark County election. Election Center, uh, but I just took a walking tour of this facility uh, not a couple minutes ago, uh, and the workers have gone home. Uh, the ballot tabulation machines are draped in what uh, I think can fairly be described as coverings that look like uh, what you would throw over the barbecue uh, in the backyard. There is not a lot of activity here tonight, uh, and they will be back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock uh, with an update. But there are many, many votes to count in this county, and they only count in this facility approximately 70,000 votes a day. It is in stark contrast to what's happening in Washoe County, uh, where Reno, Nevada is. They are counting overnight tonight with a live stream of that count available to watch on the Internet. That is not the scene uh, here whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, the 16th of this month is the date that the votes coming out of this state must be certified. If you work backwards from that, the 12th is the date that the signatures on the ballots have to be challenged by. And the 10th is the last day that mail-in ballots uh, that are postmarked uh, appropriately by Election Day yesterday uh, are able to come in and actually be counted here. So uh, we may be talking about uh, Nevada for a little time uh, yet to come. Is it clear uh, why it's being delayed, why they're not counting right now in, in Vegas? Uh, Lester, I think that we are 50 ununited states when it comes to voting, and on a more granular level, uh, each county in each state uh, has their own ways and days, frankly, uh, of counting these votes, and that's just the way that they do it here. They've expanded their staff. There are 30 people that normally work for the elections department here. That has uh, gone up to about uh, several hundred uh, other county employees that have been brought in for this purpose. Uh, the uh, registrar here is being, again, very deliberate. Uh, they are very focused on getting the job done, uh, but they are not going to do it at the expense of rushing, and I think what they believe uh, would be making a mistake. They have so much infrastructure in this warehouse behind me, uh, and they are doing it with the capacity that they have, and there's been no talk of expanding that capacity quite yet. Well, we all want to see it done right. Jacob Soboroff uh, in, in Las Vegas. And so how important is Nevada in the scheme of things if you're, if you're Team Biden right now? They, they, you, everyone matters because yeah. he, he needs that sick. Look, Pennsylvania, if you want to avoid the calamity, uh, the legal calamities that might fa you might be facing in Pennsylvania, Nevada plus plus Arizona, you get 270 right on the nose. By the way, Savannah, you were talking about we need to be thanking our uh, uh, these ballot counters. <laughs> well, listen to this, uh, Kelly O'Donnell uh, uh, and, her, and and her team down there uh, note that uh, the uh, Allegheny County, right, Pittsburgh, um, the Pittsburgh Steelers are buying dinner for all the. Uh, workers tonight as they count ballots. So, kudos Pittsburgh Cheers Steelers. Cheers to the home team. Kudos I like Rooney that. family. I like that. The Rooney family always class act. I was going to say right. NFL teams across the country. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot yeah. of yeah. workers. Once again, in the, the Rooney States. set the tape. Set All the right. set the tone. We'll take a break. Be back in a moment with more special coverage. Decision 2020 in just a moment.
watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. to try to find out where the votes are coming for uh, coming from at this hour let's show you the uh, latest boards Arizona uh, too early Biden leads fresh numbers uh, have come in an hour or so ago we expect more perhaps this half hour uh, the Pennsylvania uh, race continues to, to narrow. Too early to call Donald Trump with a lead, but it is shrinking. Let's look at Georgia. We're told by the Secretary of State's office that there are about 100,000 votes left to count. Chuck has gotten his abacus out and suggests that this is very much still a jump ball. Could go either way. Georgia's interesting. North Carolina is interesting, but it's going to be a cliffhanger and a long one because we're going to have to wait until next week before all the, the, the ballots are tabulated there. And if you're with us a moment ago, you learned uh, that Nevada also uh, it could be a few days where we get some more solid numbers out of there. Too close to call in Nevada. And let's show you where we stand on this road to 270. Uh, Biden sitting now at 253 and potentially more paths to 270, 214 right now for Donald Trump. So we saw it, Chuck, as you go over yeah. your board. Nevada's, it's a game over for tonight for ballot counting. Yes. That, Arizona that. still has some homework due. They said they would send in a few hundred thousand more votes tonight. Right. right. Um, and Pennsylvania and Georgia continue. Right. And I was just going to say, I was exactly what I was going to do, which is, okay, we know we're not going to get much update in Nevada. Uh, when, you know, if we get, we're not going to be here for the next round of vote that comes in in Arizona. The next team will be here for the for the Arizona numbers that come in around midnight tonight. That leaves us Georgia, and we did get some word that we know that the Fulton County, they 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 have said they believe they have 24,000. I'm curious to see how that matches. See, this is when it's estimated. So the Fulton County administrator said they believe they have about 24,000. We estimated, we thought there's a remaining. So it's very possible. You know, we overestimated by 7,000. So it may be if it's Of 20, how much vote there would be, would be in total. Exactly. This was always an estimate. This was always, it's a really pretty good one. But there's going to be a margin of error. Um, so I, I wanted to sit here and, and, yeah. and double. So we expect these Fulton County numbers, 24,000, according to him, not 31, uh, to come in by 3 a.m., I think they said. So um, we, I think this is one of those when you get up in the morning. Let's check out what the Georgia uh, what, what the Georgia spread is going to be. But it does sound like we're going to get some of the vote in um, tonight and tomorrow morning. And it sounds like we'll get the rest of it, I think, um, by lunchtime tomorrow. You noted North Carolina. It's just put it off the board. It's November 12th. <laughs> uh, and then and then Pennsylvania, um, I, I noticed I think this ticked down a tiny bit again. But this is a trickle. Uh, it goes to. It, the bullishness all comes from what the expectation is out of Philadelphia. Has that moved at all Has tonight since we've been at on all? it? It is everything. <laughs> Has it moved since are, last are, night? This is all Do about. We need the to get the Eagles to no. send these poll workers. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I don't know. The Eagles some, aren't having some a good season. Beer. You know, hey, I'm an Eagles fan. I, I don't. I don't need to hear it. Thank I know. you. It's a, it's, a rough, it's a rough season for the <laughs> NFC elite uh, these days. But this is the issue. Just none of the early vote has shown up. Uh, it's just not much of it. And so that's what it is. And so whether it's, pro I, I'll be curious, is it processing the envelopes? Uh, is it whatever it is, we have not budged at all. But again, let me remind you the importance of Philadelphia, the margin that matters here. Um, Andrew Mitchell's reporting was saying she's got some Democrats who think they're going to get a margin that was like Obama's 2012 margin, um, which was because we kept Romney under 100,000 votes. This was a nearly half a million uh, vote margin just in Philadelphia, they think they're going to hit that Obama spread. So that, I mean, that, that would make up, again, 
A huge get, difference. It's a huge, we're, we're up to, uh, we're, we're, uh, sorry, it's getting late. Uh, or I'm, my brain is getting late. Um, <laughs> when we're sitting here, and, and just a reminder, 184, he's going to add another, they're going to, he's going to net 120,000 likely, perhaps, and cutting into that. So then all of a sudden, Biden just needs 60,000 more extra votes out of the rest of the you state. We the know, Steelers look at Delaware and, County. What's, what, show us Pittsburgh, oh, okay, Pittsburgh, Allegheny the, County. The, the blue spot, you know, so, there, there was a time that there was a lot more blue around yeah, Pittsburgh. Yeah, all the way down. Yeah, it used to be, this was, this was sort of union. You know, it was, you had urban Democrats, Union Democrats. Well, this, this is, is why where was a Democratic Donald Trump state. made it happen and rewrote That's exactly the Pennsylvania right. map. This well, is the Union Democrats, all these Union Democratic counties, whether uh, the one, the Connor Lamb district. Well, and all so of I was that, just going to say, check is, a little bit of. Is, um, there's not, like I said, the only blue left is Allegheny. Uh, and let's just see what, how, what kind of historical performance uh, we're doing here. And as you can see, he's actually uh, performing slightly better than Clinton and Obama the last two times. Yeah, well, and Chuck, very briefly, um, you mentioned Philadelphia, obviously critical, but there's a couple House races. Republicans are watching swing areas, the Connor Lamb District, another one in outside of Scranton, where they think they're seeing Democrats tick upward, perhaps hanging on there, which they take as another potentially bad sign uh, for Donald Trump uh, in Pennsylvania. So we're waiting on Pennsylvania. Um, we might get some, you know, I'll be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if sometime tomorrow Biden takes the lead as this vote comes in. In Pennsylvania. And that 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 is a that becomes a narrative changing moment, not just, you know, not us calling the state, but just when you're waiting for these numbers, here the president wants to file lawsuits, all of a sudden he's losing Pennsylvania too. Right? And then it's, you know, you you've just you're running out of places to find your 270 electoral votes. All right, let's uh, back with us now our Democratic Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill and editor of the National Re Review, Rich Lowry. Uh, good to Lowry, good to have both of you uh, uh, with it. Claire, you're watching, hopefully, uh, uh, Chuck's explanation there at the board. Uh, what are you thinking right now tonight for uh, the Biden team and what they're seeing and what the reality is of, of, of these paths that they apparently have? Listen, it will be terrific if Joe Biden uh, carries Pennsylvania. They worked very hard there. It was the focus of their campaign. It'll be great if we can flip Arizona finally uh, in the next couple of days and put it in the Democratic column. But the prize I think the campaign would be most excited about is Georgia. Uh, that is a, a strike in the heart of the South. It is, um, and a lot of work has gone into working that vote in the Atlanta and the suburbs. And besides that, think about this. If Joe Biden wins Georgia, that has huge implications for control of the Senate, because that means if he can win Georgia, so can those Senate candidates in a, sh a few short months, which could deliver the majority to the Democrats in the Senate would be a, a game changer for the Biden administration. We, we've been talking, Georgia really wasn't anybody's mind until, I don't know, a month or two ago in, in terms of, oh, I just meant a joke. Yeah, very good. Oh, wow. In fact, yeah. last year we thought it was smooth. I yeah, it was. Smooth. You should have. I should have just owned it, right? Moved on. It, yeah. Oh, Georgia? Come on, now. there you go. I don't even remember my question. Oh, I mean, it, it wasn't it wasn't on anyone's mind oh, for, was, yeah. for months uh, heading in, you know, heading into this. I mean, you know, Chuck, we didn't have very many conversations. You and I have been talking on and off about this race uh, for, gosh, you know, a year no, plus now. This special we bought because in a runoff you never knew but even right. like the Purdue race there was a lot of you know, like it, stuff keeps running I don't know yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's one of those like Texas one of those things where every year Democrats say no really this time <laughs> no really it's gonna happen and Rich, this Rich, do you, do, Rich do you I mean do you think this is a, a significant significant moment a, a shift or is this just a 2020 anomaly of, of the way the forces came together well, it was certainly significant in terms of getting to 270 there's no doubt about that if Georgia slips out of Trump's hands, then you're on this unlikely scenario. He needs to hold on to Pennsylvania, and he needs to flip Arizona and Nevada, and that gets him to a 269-269 tie. Uh, so that, that's a pretty fanciful scenario. And look, Georgia, it, it um, reflects a lot of work by Stacey Abrams, registering a lot of new Democrats, and just the swing of suburbs against Republicans in the Trump era. Rich, I wouldn't be— yeah. 
Sure. I was just going to say. I wouldn't be as certain as Claire that uh, that it, those runoffs. If Biden wins, I think that Republicans are more likely to win those two likely two runoffs in Georgia and the Georgia Senate races rather than lose. I, I think that it would naturally the dynamic would be we're running as a check. By the way, on uh, Joe Biden, and the there's two, two examples of this. Bill Clinton wins the presidency in '92. A, uh, a Senate incumbent named Reich Fowler uh, gets forced into a runoff by a guy named Paul Coverdell. Coverdell wins the runoff. Yep. Uh, Saxby this is a deep poll check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saxby Chandler's Jim Martin in 2008. That was a shocker. Nobody expected, nobody was talking about that Senate race, end up in a runoff, and it was a blowout. But what we've never had, Rich, uh, and this is where it's never been a Democrat in one of these runoffs, an African American a Democrat is certainly somebody with the with the uh, persona mm -hmm. uh, uh, of Reverend Warnock, and that's something in talking to Republicans in Georgia who said to me that makes them very nervous because what has been the secret of their success in surviving runoffs is there has been um, there hasn't been an enthusiastic Democratic get out the vote effort, particularly among African Americans. That could change with Raphael mm -hmm. Warnock. Yeah, it could be, could be. Oh, well, we, uh, well, we'll pause. We're in suspended animation with Georgia on our minds, guys. I read Claire. <laughs> I should have. Um, I'm just kicking myself. No, I mean, it Are you going to start singing Eagles lyrics with Arizona? Yeah, right? Perhaps. Winslow, Arizona. Yeah, that, yeah. So, uh, you know I love the Eagles. Let's go to Justice Correspondent Pete Williams and Stanford Law Professor and NBC News Legal Analyst Nate Persley. Professor Persley, you're just joining us. I, it's been a very dignified broadcast for the last 24 <laughs> hours, but we're in the final stretch here. Um, let me start with Pete, because Pete we've been talking about, I look at the, the legal picture here as having two tracks. One is the recount track, which we are likely to see in Wisconsin, and we'll see how it turns out in other states. Another is the lawsuit track. And um, it, it can be death by a thousand cuts in the terms of the way we do elections. You have to file lots of lawsuits in lots of states on lots of issues, but what does it amount to? Uh, what's your take on the, the legal strategy that seems to be um, in the offing tonight? right now from the Trump campaign, potentially depending on what we see from a Biden campaign. Right. I think the lawsuits really don't amount to a great deal. They're sort of nibbling away at the margins, how, how ballots are being handled, whether observers are getting to watch them, or whether machines are checking the votes of the signatures instead of people. Uh, whether people are given the chance to cure their, their mistakes on their ballot and whether that was right or wrong. You know, the only one that's likely going to count is the one that could drag the Supreme Court into the election. And of course, that's already sitting there. It's the challenge to the Pennsylvania court order that was issued in December that extended the deadline for mail ballots until Friday. And as you know, Republicans say that was invalid. They say only the state legislature could have changed the rules. And there are at least four justices who agree with that claim. So if it turns out that the uh, outcome of the election could depend on the mail ballots in Pennsylvania that arrive between today and Friday, then the Republicans would likely ask the Supreme Court to hear their appeal and act quickly, and this time Amy Coney Barrett would be able to take part. But the big question, of course, is what's the margin of litigation? Are there enough votes to make it worthwhile to fight over? And we just don't know the answer to that. And I just want to raise one other thing that's not about lawsuits. I mentioned it yesterday at, I think, 3 in the morning or something, but it, what brought it to mind was Chuck describing earlier that the outcome of the electoral vote could be 270 to 268. And if that's the case, then I think the candidates and their parties will be leaning very hard on those presidential electors to remain faithful to their commitments, those people who meet as the electoral college. They may also face pressure campaigns to become faithless and vote for somebody else, and that could potentially change the outcome of the election. As Nate knows, this past term, the Supreme Court upheld laws in 33 states that say you have to vote for the winner of the popular vote, but the fact is only 14 of those states have laws that actually allow them to make a substitution. If somebody goes rogue, they can throw that person out and drag someone else in and say, you count the vote for the person who won the popular vote. So if it's really, really close, given all that else that's gone on, I think those, those electors are going to face a lot of pressure. I'd love to hear Nate weigh in on that, on that yeah. uh, possibility. Well, I, I sort of feel that we need to jump off that bridge when we get there. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's uh, you know, like, you know there are a lot of bridges between then and now. <laughs> 
th th there's a lot between now and then. Um, right now, we are at the sort of throw spaghetti at the wall phase of litigation, which is that we have all kinds of claims that are being uh, launched by the Trump campaign, uh, and we don't know which ones, if any, will stick. But a lot of it is, is sort of continuing the campaign narrative against absentee ballots that they're inherently fraudulent or problematic. And so there's allegations of political manipulation or uh, departures from the legislative, you know, from the statutes in the states, or that uh, there's been other malfeasance, um, including going beyond the deadlines. And so we'll see, again, whether any of that matters in terms of shifting the margin of uh, litigation in, in, in each of these states. I want to emphasize one other thing, though, which I think dovetails with what Pete was saying, which is that part of the strategy here is also to delay, right, to, to prevent a final count and certification from happening in these states. Uh, and then if you do that, well, then, then we could see some action with respect to the state legislatures. But these states are going to get these recounts done, or not just the recounts, the counts done in the next few days, uh, and then we'll have a really good idea as to who's in the head. This is a maybe too technical of a question, but are, as a general matter, are courts deferential to the local authorities, the election officials, the states and their own processes? I mean, are they kind of reluctant to disrupt the business of, of elections? In general, yes. But um, one thing we saw this term with the cases that went up to the Supreme Court is that when it comes to presidential elections, there's a real fissure on the Supreme Court as to whether they will give deference to local officials or whether they put sort of primacy in the state legislature. Uh, this was a sort of zombie legal argument that seemed to be put to rest with Bush versus Gore, but which has come up in the last few years. And it's, it seems that at least five members of the Supreme Court now probably believe it. All right. We know four for sure, maybe five, with Amy Coney Barrett there. Okay. Well, um, oh, the plot is always thickening, especially when you get Pete Williams and uh, Professor Persley involved. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Well, well the faceless elector thing. That, I mean, you know, exactly. I, I think Hillary Clinton's going to be a New York elector. I think I read that, that Hillary Clinton was going to be. And yeah. by the way, though, campaigns, because of this faithless elector thing, campaigns now do spend we more time if we're gonna making talk sure. About it. Making sure, right, the actual people who cast the ballot. Yes, so that's what the Electoral, electoral College is. Yeah. It's actually 538 people who will meet in early December and actually cast those votes on behalf of the states, and they're supposed to cast the votes that represent the popular vote in their particular states. But this issue of a faithless elector, the notion that perhaps because of a pressure campaign, some elector might say, you know what? You call I'm it actually going to vote for the other guy. I call it it's what's in the Constitution. Well, and and, and, and that's the thing. I, I'll be honest. I I actually, I thought that when that case went in there, and, I, and that it's written into the Constitution. It's one of those things that I was surprised they allowed that to be upheld. They allowed the state. Uh, the, the state restrictions on it to be upheld. That one mildly surprised me for, from all our strict constitutionalists. All right. Well, well um, we shall see. <laughs> stock market. Stock market yeah. has reacted in, in a big way to all this, and not the way that many people might uh, might have assumed. Uh, these are the futures. Let's, before I get it over my head, let's go to senior <laughs> business correspondent Stephanie Rule. Stephanie, tell me why the market uh, seems to like this uncertainty. Well, I promise, Lester, it is not over your head. Um, we are seeing a futures market extend the gains that we saw earlier today. And it's not just about one candidate or the other, because obviously we don't know the winner. It's also about the process. And it might not feel like it to all of us who are waiting here for minutes and hours, but the process is actually working. The markets are very sensitive to big disruptions. They were worried about voting irregularities, social unrest. And for the most part, we haven't seen any of that. Our anxiety is high, but that's about it. And, you know, where it's interesting for the president, President Trump has called himself Mr. Market. Chuck, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. No one is better at selling this economy than President Trump. And if you look at what the stock market has done, it's performed very well over the last few years, and it's been one of the president's best scorecards. We even saw it work in the exit polls. For senior citizens who are reliant on their retirement income, many of them stayed with Trump. They listened to him when he said, without me, you'll lose your 401k. However, here we are. The stock market continues to go up, and Joe Biden is ticking higher in terms of electoral votes. All right, Stephanie Rule, thanks very much. Uh, we're going to take a break. More to come as Decision 2020 special coverage continues. Don't go anywhere.
ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're right there with you. Whether you're back to school. What do you guys think? We're excited? Or back to work. We're keeping you safe. I love being back. <laughs> Every morning on today. Police murder of unarmed black men has been an American way of death across centuries. After seeing the most comprehensive police reform bill ever introduced in Congress, I've begun to wonder if now is the time, if now is the time the protesters finally win. The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell, weeknights at 10 on MSNBC. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, next in line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. A real close-knit group of nurses who pulled together when their boss needed help battling coronavirus. You're not just any patient. You're their friend. These folks saved my life. Thank God that there are people who want to run towards a pandemic as opposed to running away from a pandemic. Introducing the MSNBC Daily, featuring written perspectives by experts you know and trust for a better understanding of the stories that matter most. Check out the MSNBC Daily today at msnbc.com. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Are people there concerned about what impact this could have on the election? It's news made for your streaming world. Watch what they do, not what they say. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail. At the center of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Welcome back to Decision 2020 coverage. It is uh, another night of waiting for the numbers to come in. We've got six states. We have still not reported uh, the final numbers, so we continue to watch uh, those. We want to go right now to Arizona. Gotti Schwartz has been watching, uh, well, he was watching the actual count a few moments ago. He's moved outside where uh, people are letting their opinions know. What do you got? I just watched you. Hey, Lester, how's it going? Yeah, so uh, we are, we're not turning on the lights because we don't want to totally draw peaceful. too much attention to us. Rachel Maddow, we're going to see totally uh, that there's going to be some people that are pretty prayer. antagonistic. Um, but right now what they're doing is they are gathering in front of the election center. Inside, they are counting uh, all those ballots, those 300 or so thousand ballots that are still uh, outstanding. And inside, what you're hearing, uh, it, it, poll workers are hearing a lot of the chanting out here. Uh, they're hearing people uh, screaming, and then we've got this crowd. And we're gonna we're gonna walk this way uh, just to show you. We've actually got a, a pretty sizable convoy coming in uh, of trucks. We've got some trucks coming in over on the side here. Uh, the crowd continues to grow, and what we're seeing is we've got a police presence over here on this side. Uh, 
but then over to the to the left here again we're trying not to bring too much attention to ourselves we're trying to be uh, uh, keep a low profile so you're not going to see the lights and it's it's t difficult uh, to see exactly what we're talking about um, but you've got this pretty large crowd right here in front of uh, sorry <laughs> this is this is what happens whenever you come out here you, we're trying to document what's happening we're trying to document uh, what the people inside uh, are listening to as they're counting those ballots now the unfortunate thing that we've seen is that a lot of these uh, polling uh, these em employees at the polling center they have to come out and they are greeted by this uh, rather large crowd we're going to come up this way uh, and you can see that there are sheriff's deputies that are surrounding this crowd. Let me show you what it looks like when these poll workers come out. We've seen them escorted out and uh, put into a van and then uh, driven somewhere. And then down in the crowd, we have seen uh, some people with guns, uh, but so far they have insisted that this is a very uh, peaceful protest. Just a little while ago, we saw a couple people with rifles slung on their back. Uh, in fact, you've got a, a gentleman down there that you see with a He's got a, some sort of tactical vest on, and then right next to him is a woman who's got a, a rifle slung on her back. The crowd has been here for about an hour. Uh, they hey, got in the Capitol. They came here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Lester. I mean, what, what, exa what exactly is it that they, they want or what message are they trying to send? Well, interestingly enough, just a little while ago, they were chanting, Fox News sucks, Fox News sucks. They were saying uh, that they were angry o over Fox News uh, calling this race, calling Arizona for Biden early on. Uh, obviously, it's still too close to call. It's still too early in this process. Uh, but they were directing their anger uh, towards what seemed to be Fox News for a little while. They're also directing their anger uh, at the officials here. Uh, there was a group of them trying to get inside. They were asked to leave because they weren't wearing masks, asked to come outside to talk. Uh, and then uh, the, the crowd appeared. So we're not exactly sure uh, what all of their uh, their complaints are. We have heard uh, them talk about how this election is being stolen uh, from the president. We have heard them talk about uh, the use of Sharpies in the election. We checked into that. Uh, some of them were saying that they used Sharpies and they were given Sharpies during their election process, and that invalidated their vote. Uh, that appears to be not the case at all. In fact, uh, election officials say oftentimes those Sharpies work better uh, and they have been told to uh, they've been told to use those sharpies because the ink dries faster. So uh, the officials here have assured us that all those votes are going to be canceled, can, uh, counted. But as you can see, this crowd is just uh, filled with a lot of people are voicing their anger here in front of where poll workers are trying to tabulate those votes. Well, right. people blowing off steam. It's unfortunate because we were talking about the, po the poll workers and the work that they're tirelessly working. It's late there. Uh, it's late everywhere. Um, not partisans. Leave them out of it. Well, you know, and it's ironic, too, because the, they're counting votes, and that's Donald Trump's best hope right now in Arizona, <laughs> right. that they'll count those votes and that, that the margins true. will become slimmer. But, you know, the, this is a time of great tension as we wait here. It's the second night. It's Wednesday night. We don't know who the president is yet. So, uh, you know, you understand why tensions boil over, but hopefully it's not directed at the good people who are just trying to count votes. Let's go to NBC News presidential historian Michael Beschloss. And, Michael, I mean, this is a time. We need a historian. We need perspective. That's the antidote to times of unrest and, and anxiety. Yeah, you know, we are a divided country, but we always have been. And, you know, we've always gone through all these crises from Valley Forge with George Washington through the Civil War, Great Depression, World War II, uh, the Cold War, you know, all these things. Somehow America always survives and flourishes. And whenever we're in a time like this, I think the best thing is to say, never bet against the United States, because through all of this, for all of our applause, and for all the times when many people have suffered in a way they never should have, in the end, the country survives and finds some way to get through and improve our, it, it itself. And I think the one thing, Savannah, if we had to look at the next you know, two months or so until the next inauguration, it would be to say, let's quickly, if it is at all possible, count all the votes fully, accurately, fairly, and get to a point where there's someone who concedes, someone who accepts victory, and whoever is next president, taking that, that oath in January is someone who is sworn not only to be president, but to do a job that is important to a president, which is to unite this bleeding and divided country.
It's a big challenge. Those were comforting words, but it is a, it is a big challenge in an era of the way we communicate and social media and, and the, so things, right, you know, the, the things that change the conversation or direct sometimes the conversation. But uh, Michael Bechelow, I always appreciate hearing your thoughts, and thanks for giving that right. historical perspective. We were talking about it on the Today Show at the end this morning. You know, just in a moment, if you can do the thought exercise and think about what it would be like to be in the other person's shoes, somebody who voted for the person you didn't vote for, and try to find in your mind some compassion and grace. You know, we are Americans, we are humans, and we will get through this together. And I think that's, um, if we could all adopt that perspective, I think it would help make these days and weeks be a little more peaceful. It's well, a we great challenge for our politics. It we is. will continue to watch the counts right. as they come in and come back on the air as events warrant. I'll see you tomorrow. Washington feels more chaotic than ever. It's my job to ask the tough questions, left and right, and help you make sense of it all. You ready to go to work? I'm so ready to go to work. She's Joe Biden's choice to be next in line. But who is Kamala Harris? Join me, Joy Reid, as I explore her life's journey from Oakland to Washington on my six-part podcast, Kamala, Next in Line. New episodes every Monday. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. President Trump and Joe Biden hit the trail at the center today. of this campaign, coronavirus. The story. The battleground blitz as we enter the final stretch of the 2020 race. From every angle. If you were sitting here talking to Joe Biden and President Trump, what would you want to tell him right now? On the ground. The wind standing these flames are expected to last another 24 hours. And in depth. We now have two vaccine trials on hold. Should people be concerned? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning. Welcome to today. We're glad to have you with us. This fall, we're 